<clears throat> Good morning, and uh, welcome to what I think is the 232nd Johnson Town Meeting. Uh, traditionally, we have opened the town meeting with the Pledge of Allegiance, and uh, I have a, a volunteer who has uh, agreed to come up and, and lead us. Oh, please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Yep. We have a few housekeeping matters before we actually begin with the meeting. <clears throat> the first is, I believe there's been an historical society um, <clears throat> questionnaire that is uh, here and about, and uh, if you have one or if you would seek one out and uh, complete it, uh, the historical society would appreciate that. We, <clears throat> we have the honor of uh, two communications which have been sent to uh, the town of Johnson, or more specifically to two of its uh, select persons, uh, which I will read to you, dated March 5th, 2024. The first is addressed to uh, chair of this board, Beth Floyd. <clears throat> Excuse me. Beth Foy. Uh, Dear Beth, thank you for your term of service on the Johnson Select Board and for serving as chair of the Select Board during such a consequential time for the Johnson community. Despite only having served for a year when July's catastrophic flooding hit, I understand you acted quickly under difficult circumstances to support your community through this challenging and fast moving situation. Thank you for your commitment to Johnson and your neighbors. Your work has not gone unnoticed and serves as an example for others to follow. The state of Vermont and the community of Johnson are grateful for your public service and ability to lead during an emergency response. I join your family, friends, and colleagues in celebrating your achievements and recognizing your contributions to the community. I wish you the best in your future endeavors, sign Philip B. Scott, Governor. <clears throat> but wait, there's more. This is a just... Good thing I didn't let you know. Okay. okay, thank you very much. Okay, we're going to test. Test, is that better? How about in the back? Raise your hand if you can hear me. Okay. <clears throat> this uh, is addressed to Evan Patch. Dear Evan, Thank you for your term of service on the Johnson Select Board and for serving as emergency management director during such a consequential time for the Johnson community. It's, <clears throat> it's clear you went above and beyond to help others recover from the devastating impacts of July's flooding. Not only did you take time off from your job to lead the town's emergency response, but acted quickly to support your community while still new <clears throat> to this volunteer role. Your ability to step up <clears throat> to this challenge is greatly appreciated. Thank you for your commitment to Johnson and your fellow community members. Your work <clears throat> has not gone unnoticed and serves as an example to others to follow. I'm grateful for your public service and you have made a difference for your community and state. 
I join your family, friends, and colleagues in celebrating your achievements and recognizing your contributions to your community. I wish you the best in your future endeavors. Signed, Philip B. Scott, Governor. For more than 200 years, the uh, citizens of Johnson have gathered on the first <clears throat> Tuesday in March uh, to do the town's business. Um, hang on just a second. Uh, I wish to thank uh, all of you who have taken uh, the time and inconvenience uh, to attend this meeting. It's vitally important. It, determines the, the tax rate that uh, folks are going to have to deal with and uh, also other issues that are uh, important to the operation of, of government in the town of Johnson for the coming year. And I thank you for, the, for your uh, inconvenience and uh, your presence and your judgment. Now here are the kind of the rules of the road for, for our meeting. First of all, we, we need to deal with the, uh, the question of eligible voters. Uh, you are an eligible voter if your name appears on the checklist, which is located over by the doors here. Uh, are there any folks here who are not uh, on that list, who are not legal voters in the town of Johnson? That was a very timid. <laughs> okay. Um, that being the case, uh, I am going to request <clears throat> a motion um, to the effect that our <clears throat> town manager, excuse me, our town manager Thomas Gallinat, uh, and. Senator Richard Westman, Representatives Daniel Noyes, and Melanie Carpenter, all of whom will uh, wish to address uh, this body, none of whom are residents, appreciate a motion to uh, allow them to uh, address this meeting. Second. There is a motion to that effect. Is there a second? second. There is a second. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor of the motion to uh, allow <clears throat> Thomas Gallinat, Richard Westman, Dan Noyes, and Melanie Carpenter to address uh, this meeting, signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. Ayes have it. Uh, we are required uh, by law to record our doings here, and in order to do that, um, we have microphones or around, um, <clears throat> actually three to be specific, uh, and in order to create a proper record for that, people who wish to speak, who are recognized by me to speak, uh, must come to a microphone, identify themselves to the record, uh, and then proceed with whatever it is they have to say. Uh, this, is, this is not an optional uh, matter with us. It's, uh, it's a requirement. <clears throat> a number of offices uh, for the town are being voted on here today. Uh, and uh, they are being voted on the Australian ballot. Campaigning for any person who appears on that ballot within this building or on walkways or driveways leading to this building, uh, that, is, can, that kind of campaigning is prohibited uh, by law. Under 17 VSA, 2508 sections A, B, and C. So I appreciate it if uh, you all 
respect that uh, that mandate. Uh, at this point, it's after nine o'clock. I'm sure that the polls have opened for voting, but uh, I won't declare the uh, poll, declare the polls open uh, for voting on those items which are on the Australian ballot. And now, probably the most boring aspect of this job, I am required to read you the warning. So try to stay awake. Warning of the annual town meeting for the town of Johnson, Vermont, March 5, 2024. The legal voters in the town of Johnson, Vermont are hereby notified and warned to meet in town meeting at the gymnasium of the Johnson Elementary School in said Johnson on Tuesday, March 5, 2024 at nine o'clock in the forenoon local time to transact the following articles of business. Article one, shall the voters <clears throat> elect the following town officers. One, elect the moderator for the town meeting. Two, elect the select, a select board officer for a two year term. Three, elect select board officer for a three-year term. Four, <clears throat> elect grand juror. Five, elect an auditor for three years. Six, elect an auditor for two-year term, balance of three-year term. Elect the town delinquent tax collector. Elect plot cemetery agent. Elect Whiting Hill cemetery agent. Elect trustees of public money. Elect library trustee for a five-year term. Elect library trustee for a three-year term, balance of a five-year term. And elect a library trustee for a two-year term, balance of a five-year term. To elect two Lamoille North Modified Unified Union School District Board of Directors for a three-year term. Notice hereby given that ballot boxes for the reception of ballots for the election of town and Moyle Modified Union School District Officers, Articles 1 and 2, will be open at 9 a.m. when town meeting opens and shall close at 7 p.m. in the evening. Next, annual town meeting. Article 5, to hear and act upon the reports of town officials and those presented. Article four, to establish rates of compensation for the town officers, if any. Article five, shall the voters authorize total fund expenditures for the operating expenses of $3,375,751.67, of which an estimated $2,192,185.97 shall be raised by taxes and an estimated $1,073,565.70 by non-tax revenues. Article six, shall the town vote to collect property taxes to the town treasurer for equal installments per 32 VSA 4792, as listed below, with delinquent taxes and assessments having charged against them an 8% commission after the fourth installment per 32 VSA 1674, and interest charges of 1% per month or fraction thereof for the first three months, and thereafter 1.5% per month or fraction thereof from the, day, <coughs> the due date of such tax. Shall interest be imposed on a fraction of a month as if it were an entire month per 32 VSA 5136. Payments are due in the hands of the treasurer by 4 p.m. on the below due dates, first installment to be paid on or before Monday, August 12, 2024, second installment to be paid on or before Tuesday, November, November 12, 2024, third installment to be paid on or before Monday, <coughs> February, 10, 2025, fourth installment to be paid on or before Monday, May 12th, 2025. Article seven, will the town vote to exempt Masonic Temple 
uh, from municipal town taxes for a period of five years. Article 8, shall the voters prohibit the town constable from exercising any law enforcement authority in accordance with 24 of the SA section 193 uh, sub A parens A close parens. Article 9, shall the town establish a reserve fund to be called paving reserve fund to be used for paving and paving maintenance in accordance with 24 VSA 2804 to be funded by one <clears throat> or a combination of a dedicated budget line item, uh, year-end balances from paving budget line items, or reservation of year and budget surplus. Article 10, shall the voters of the Town of Johnson authorize the select board to prepare or have prepared and act upon a preliminary plan for merger with the village of Johnson in accordance with the provisions set forth in Title 24, VSA, Chapter 49. Article 11, shall the voters of the town of Johnson authorize the town to raise, appropriate, and expend up to $60,000 for the purposes of Article 10, contingent on the voters of the village of Johnson approving a similar article to Article 10. Shall the town of Johnson vote to raise, appropriate, and expend the sum of $1,500 for the support of River Arts to provide services to the residents of the town? And finally, Article 13, to transact any other businesses may be properly brought before this town meeting. Signed uh, <clears throat> 26th of January, 2024, and signed by all of the select board members. Okay, if we, uh, <clears throat> we will then move on to Article 3 to hear and act upon the reports of the town officers and those presented. This generally is uh, considered as a report to you from the board with regard to the, the various ta <clears throat> tables and reports that appear in the town report. And uh, with that in mind, I will turn over the microphone to the chair of the board to uh, deal with one of the early um, entries uh, in that report. Thank you very much. Um, I just want to take a minute to speak to the dedication within the town report. Um, Jean Engel, thank you very much for all that you've done for our community, for the library, and just um, at large, your willingness to really commit and make things happen. Um, you have truly made things happen in the past nine months since the flood um, and even before that. So the dedication is very much well-deserved and I just wanna thank you. And if we could all give Jean uh, a round of applause. Um, I'm going to turn it back over to David, and we'll jump into budget when we get to the article around approving budget. Are there any additions or corrections to the town reports as distributed um, as compared to you know what we know now? Just the questions and any corrections that the board wants to make to the town reports. 
Um, yes, there are corrections to the town report. Um, we have a updated capital budget spreadsheet that was the approved spreadsheet by the, by the select board. Um, there's one line modified that pushes the, what is the equipment? Okay. The backhoe um, line, sorry, I just couldn't think of the word. I am not a heavy equipment person, <laughs> um, but it pushes the backhoe um, purchase and installments out a little bit um, to help save some money. So if you're interested in looking at the capital budget very specifically, which is on page, Uh, right here page 33 of your town report there is an updated printed copy at the table where you checked in um, additionally there is an adjustment to the tax rate I'm gonna let Tom speak to the details or um, if he would but essentially the um, printed tax rate has a two 0.19 tax rate, and it actually should be a 2.242. Um, Tom, can you just come speak to the ad that adjustment, please? So there's a the difference in the beginning is the difference of amount to be raised in taxes each year, and that's a 2.24. But the calculated difference in in the anticipated tax rate is 2.19, and the reason for that is. I, uh, I reached out to our listers before I put the report together and the grand list value changes over the course of the year. Um, and so every time there's like new construction or changes in value, I like some houses, there were some changes uh, because of the flood. Uh, or maybe the grand list value went down or maybe there was new construction, maybe a new shed was built and the grand list value goes up. And so as the grand list value goes up, the tax rate goes down um, and vice versa. And so as I got a more accurate number, um, that actually drove the tax rate down. So that 2.19, that's why that's different than the 2.24. Um, typically in the past, uh, Johnson does not do that. And that was something I brought from Peachum and I'm sorry, I shouldn't have done that. <laughs> it was a mistake I made, but so that's the 2.19 uh, versus the 2.24. Are there any questions? Is there a second? second? There is a second. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, the motion is before you to accept the reports as, as amended and explained in the, uh, <clears throat> the town manager's report. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Motion is carried. Article 4, to establish the rates of compensation for the town officers, if any, is there a motion? Can we hear what they're currently getting? Identify, hang on just a second. Let's, let's, let's get some good habits going here. Can you uh, identify yourself to the record, please? Uh, Eric Osgood, just curious what the current rate of compensation is. Okay. Uh, the, cur the current rate? The current rates of comp compensation are 2000 for chair and 1500 for other select board members. Yes. Is there a second? second? Is there a discussion? Seeing none, question is before you. The motion is to establish rates of compensation for town officers at $2,000 for the select board chair and $1,500 for the other members. All those in favor of that motion signify by saying aye. aye. Those opposed, no. Motion is carried. <clears throat> Article 5. Shall the voters authorize total fund expenditures for 
operating expenses of $3,375,751.67, of which an estimated $2,192,185.97 shall be raised by taxes and an estimated $1,073,565.70 by non-tax revenues. Is there a motion? Okay. It's been moved to approve the uh, <coughs> expenditures as read. Uh, is there a second to that motion? Second. There is a second to the motion. Discussion? Okay, here's where it gets fun and a little boring all at the same time. Um, so we're gonna start off by looking, we'll go through the budget uh, items within the town report. Um, we'll start on page 19. I actually want to look at the detailed version as opposed to the summary version. And I'd actually like to kick off by talking about property tax revenue versus grant revenue versus other non-tax revenue. And I'm just going to invite Tom just to speak to that really quickly. Um, and then we'll dive into the details of the budget. So if you look at the article, I mean, this is really the meat and potatoes of the day, right? Because we're voting on what to expend and set our tax rate. Um, two thirds of that number uh, comes from taxes. Just, you know, it's a total grand list value divided by the um, your property, right? And it's pretty pretty straightforward. And that last million dollars, about 600,000, comes from state and federal, uh, whether it's highway, um, state highway aid. Um, there's about 500,000 that comes in pilot payment. That's from the college. Um, that's an enormous asset for our town and keeping our tax rate low. So everything we can do to support the college, we should probably keep doing that. Um, and then the remaining 400,000 is uh, whether it's from our reserves, maybe we're pulling reserves from previous years and we're putting that towards uh, this year's tax rate to lower. But it's also from grant funding too. Um, a lot of grants are often pass-throughs where you spend 600000 you get 600000 um, And then there's also grants where maybe we use our, our labor um, and our labor actually is already budgeted, right? But because we use our labor, it turns into an income source. And we're seeing that on the highway. Uh, next year, we're working on Footbrook Road. We're putting in a new culvert, and we're also doing some ditching uh, through the Better Roads program. And then the grant and aid program is going to continue down over hill. And so those are really exciting projects. Um, Jason has done a really wonderful job. Uh, and his, he likes to utilize these grants, but then he actually goes an extra mile, and they'll do an extra 1,000 feet. The excavator's already rented. The time's already paid for. Let's just get it done. And so Johnson's actually leading the way with our... Uh, municipal roads, general permit. Um, if you look at our town versus others, Johnson's killing it. Jason's doing a great job. And he's also bringing money into the town by doing it. So I think if you see him, say good job. He deserves it. Um, and lastly, I want to talk real quick about grants. Um, they kind of come about in two ways, right? Sometimes a grant pops up and it defines the project. We saw that with the EDA grant um, in the industrial park. And so that can set limitations, it can kind of, but it also presents opportunities. Um, because of the industrial park, um, it kind of moves some focus to a public private partnership with Vermont Electric Co-op across the street, where we're putting in a stormwater project with them. Um, as municipalities and government can't keep up, um, public private partnerships kind of stepping into government slowly. I think we're going to see more of that in the next 10 or 15 years. Um, and, and it's starting here with Vermont Electric Co-op. But that also created opportunity for now, maybe stormwater outflow from the industrial park, or maybe it creates opportunity for maybe a new sewage treatment center outflow, you know? So it's like, would these grants come a potential for opportunities that we didn't see, right? And so that's really kind of exciting. And then the other part about grants that I really love is, uh, you know, like the rail trail, um, they have passion and need, right? A need. Uh, you have. The Arboretum, they have a need, um, the skate park especially, right? And so that need defines what you go look for, right? And so that's where you guys come in. It's like, what is your need? And bring it to the select board, and then maybe we can find the grant to fill it. And that really brings the room together. I think last night was one of the most beautiful moments in my municipal career. Uh, we had a room full of people, and not a single person said no. It was, how do we get to yes? And it was really surrounding about a future of a a historic building, but also a future of a community and the library. And so I think 
Um, the more we can come together to define those needs, and the more you can actually articulate that to the select board, um, the better Johnson will be tomorrow, but it'll also help reduce our tax rate because that in the end as well, <laughs> kind of tying it all together. But um, yeah, thank, thank you. Thanks, Tom. Um, one thing that wasn't mentioned and isn't part of that total um, 1 million non-tax revenue um, is the grant that we are awarded from Northern Borders Catalyst Program. Um, we were awarded a $861,000 grant. There will be matching funds that need to go along with that. You'll hear more about that from the board, um, but you will not see that in the fiscal year 25, which starts July 1. Um, those numbers don't include that. Um, they're they're um, included as we uh, get a little bit further into the process and we start collecting some of those funds um, when the work begins, um, potentially as early as this fiscal year. Um, okay, stepping into the um, budget and just going through a quick review. Um, so we're looking again at page 19 um, we're going to be looking at column G, so the very last column um, is the proposed budget column. Um, that right now, the current tax taxes are listed at $2.192 um, million. Um, and then I'm just going to basically scan through, ask if anyone has questions on each page, um, and I'll point out areas that I think are of importance. Um, I won't go through every line item. So for the first page, I don't have any specific notes. Are there any questions on page 19? I'll give everyone just a minute to scan. Okay, seeing none. If you do have questions and we've passed by, just raise your hand, come to the mic, uh, say your name, and we'll go ahead and get your question answered. Um, moving on to page 20, um, there is one, we're looking at revenue still, and there is one notable item within column F, which is our current year, um, estimated year end, and that notable item is on row 61. It's called ARPA transfer, and this is where the, um, afford, uh, the um, ARPA money that came in from COVID um, through federal dollars and through the state you know, the state distributed through federal dollars. Um, Johnson was awarded, um, I believe, six, uh, over 600,000. Um, you can correct me if I'm wrong on that number, but I think that's the correct number. Um, thank you. And we decided to bring that into our operating budget because if we didn't spend the money, it would, uh, by a certain date, it would be, it would disappear. So we needed to do something with it quickly so that we could use it later. Um, we'll talk about this ARPA money again in a minute, but one notable thing is that this number reflected in the actual year end or applied to our operating budget isn't the total 600 and whatever thousand dollars um, because some of it has already been spent. Uh, 46,500 was spent on engineering work that we needed for the light industrial park um, and 50,000 um, was applied um, and spent uh, for Lamoille FiberNet to help get us high-speed internet access universally so everyone has access to affordable high-speed internet. Um, and, and from what I hear, they're making really great progress. Um, so we did, we did contribute 50,000 of ARPA money to that. Um, I don't have any other notes on page 20, so if anyone has a question on page 20, please go ahead and raise your hand or come to the mic. Okay, um, page 21, again, we're still looking at revenue. Um, the only thing that I'll just call out is our total revenue is $3.375 million. Um, and then we get into expense. So expense begins on line 128, still on page 21, and moves into page 22. On page 22, we are talking about um, general um, administration 
uh, expenses and select board expense, which is basically government expense. It's, it's a catch-all for anything we're spending money on. Um, one thing I do want to call out very specifically on page 22 is on line 160. There's a lot, it's called select board uh, consultant services. And it really is about using um, vendors or consultants for different work. In this case, um, in our current year, for estimated year end, we spent 50, or we expect to spend um, $58,500. And the reason for that is um, engineering study costs. So uh, the, some of those engineering expenses um, for the light industrial park. Um, okay, any questions on page 22? Eric? Uh, I don't think the mic's on. Can you can you see if the green light is on? Eric yep. Osgood. I'll just begin by saying it's a lot nicer being on this side of the table than that one. Uh, There's still time, Eric. <laughs> <laughs> Line 155, reappraisal fund. Just wondering, what is the CLA now? What do we have in the reserve fund? And when do we think a total uh, or a complete town reappraisal will need to be done? Mm, those are all good and hard questions. So we can see what is in the reserve fund by going to page um, 30, page 30. It's as of fiscal year 23 year end, so June 30 of 2023 it is the number represented. Um, which line is it? Anticipated, okay. Right now we have, sorry, I'm gonna use one. Um, 310,780 dollars. Oh, thank you. Um, our CLA is 74.15% um, and our COD is 22.64%. And you will also see that we are proposing with surplus, surplus for the end of the year um, that we add an additional uh, reappraisal, $20,000. Um, assuming we have surplus at the end of this fiscal year. And sorry, Duncan, I don't know what I'm reading. Do you want to speak to it? That should. With the, with the additional funds that we are putting in from um, surplus, we should. At the end of this fiscal year. Correct. We should end up with 84,697. Actually, that's the. 2023 surplus being applied. Okay, and in terms of timing on doing reappraisals, the board hasn't yet decided on it, on timing for reappraisal. Um, we expect that we will get a letter from the state of Vermont telling us we have to um, do a reappraisal within a certain amount of time. We have yet to receive that letter. Um, so we are, are um, working through what it could look like for um, reappraisals over a period of time, but we don't, uh, we have not settled. So a question for a new board. <laughs> Unless somebody else on the board wants to chime in. If you do, you need to come to the mic. Um, so last we heard, the state of Vermont has suspended the requirement for reappraisals, um, but that will change at some point in the future. Did I answer all your questions? Thank you. Okay. Uh, I'm glad you asked questions. Okay. Um, so we were on page 22. Are there any other questions about expenses on page 22? 
Kyle? Kyle News. Um, not really a question, but just a, um, a thank you for the forward thinking on putting money in the, gra the grant matching fund. I think that's really, really important for the future of the town and um, getting grants. So thank you for that and please continue. <laughs> Thanks, Kyle. I agree. It's better than coming out of the operating budget. Uh, yeah. Okay, uh, moving on to page 23. Um, the thing that I would like to just call out, let me just make sure that this is where it is. I didn't know it on my page, I should have. This isn't where it is, sorry. Um, no notes on page 23. If question, folks have questions, please ask. Okay, um, and these again are just um, you know, miscellaneous operating expense. Um, and then we move into build, buildings and ground. And, um, and some of this is about funding um, um, repairs to buildings and that type of thing, um, mowing expenses, that type of thing. Uh, one thing I do want to call out on page 24, which is a very, which is a significant part of our budget is um, law enforcement, Align 250, um, is half a million dollars. And I just want to call it out because it is a big line item. Um, we typically work with Hyde Park and Wilcott and the Sheriff's, Sheriff's Department to um, discuss what the increase will be. And that is a 3% increase from last year. Um, so I just want to call it out. Um, then we move into library and recreation on the, on page 25. Are there any questions on library or recreation expenses? Okay. I told you this would be the boring part. It's a little boring. I know. Okay. Next up is page 26, um, we t where we talk about skate park, historical society, and Tuesday Night Live expenses. Um, there's one thing I do want to call out on this, because if you look at um, expected year end compared to prior years and compared to the next, the proposed budget on line 318, you'll see a site capital improvement expense of $36,000. Um, most of that is coming in through grant revenue. Um, actually, not most. I believe all of that is coming in through grant revenue. Um, so that expense is a revenue in, expense out type of um, spend. Um, okay, moving on to page 27, where we get into the highway budget. Oh, sorry. That's yes, Kim. Kim. It's Kim Dunkley, and I just, um, I'm, I'm, yes, I'm behind the... I'm behind on you. Page okay. 24, there was a, a clock expense, and I just wanted to find out um, how the town clock, if there's any updates on that, and if we will have a town clock that works. I'm going to hand over to, oh. OK, Mark is our clock expert. And so if you don't mind, maybe we can see if he shows back up. Uh, and Evan, will you text him? Um, so let's, can I hold that thought, Kim, and come back to you? Thank you. Um, okay, Skate Park Historical Society Tuesday Night Live, we talked about, okay, how, getting into highway. Um, Tom spoke about, so looking at the rows um, 377 and 378, um, it's about uh, capital projects. Those are largely grant funded as well. And Tom spoke about the projects that are expected on Footbrook and Overhill um, earlier when he was speaking. So um, that's where some of those expenses for fiscal year 25 come in. Just gonna hold there to see if anyone wants to, don't see a lot of heads down. So I'm gonna keep moving. Moving on to page 28. Um, again, we're still in highway budget. Uh, 
One thing to call out on highway budget on page 28 is line 395 on culverts. You'll see that our current estimated year end spend is up. Um, we did purchase additional culverts um, hearing that the costs would go up uh, at the time we purchased them. So um, we got a little bit more than normal and you'll see that our fiscal year budget 25 is lower than um, our year end expected for this year um, for that reason. And we also got some grant reimbursement for um, a little bit of that too. I don't know, sorry, I don't know the exact no number off the top of my head. Um, questions on highway budget overall? No, okay. Excellent, and then we'll move into page 29. And um, these are the um, requests for community um, allocations that we've historically supported. Um, and you'll, there's no change there in terms of that support. Um, and you'll see that one of our uh, future articles is about adding an additional community resource. Okay, so moving on um, to page, sorry, that's all budget, operating budget. If there's any questions on operating budget, um, please go ahead and come to the mic. Um, in the meantime, I'm gonna move to page 30 where we talk about cash on hand. You can see at the top of page 30, the top half is about the reserve funds we have set up and the um, dollars in those reserve funds. <clears throat> and again, that's as of uh, June 30th, 2023. Um, and then it, in the midsection, it talks about the approved reservations uh, for cash on hand. And then the bottom section talks about um, proposed reservations of reserve fund, <clears throat> assuming we have surplus. I'm not used to talking this long. <laughs> uh, so questions on cash on hand. Uh, and the following page is about reserve fund balances. Um, and you can see the fiscal year 22 and fiscal year 23 end of year balance with the change. Again, um, that's as of June 30, 2023. Okie doke. Um, on page 32, it talks about um, calculations around um, amount to be raised by taxes. This is the thing we voted on earlier. Um, you'll see the estimated, so in the box, the very bottom row, you'll see the estimated percentage of percentage change tax rate, actual to estimate, um, where we approved the vote a few minutes ago um, from the 2.19% to the 2.242. Um, so that's where you can see that value. Uh, and then on page 33. Page 33 is about capital expense. Um, so we can basically depreciate over time spending money that we've set aside. Um, the one change on this sheet is the back which is line 38. You'll see in the print copy at the back, there, there's a replacement to this. This is not the uh, version we approved. The version we approved is on the table in the back uh, if you'd like a copy. But that line 38 basically adjusts the numbers. Let me tell you specifically. Um, it adjusts the numbers so that um, the purchase happens in fiscal year 27 um, and the payments go through fiscal year 31. So that shifts everything out a little bit, which ultimately helps with um, the cash flow for our um, capital purchase budget and plan. It's really a it's really a eight year plan. Okay, any questions at all on anything budget? Mark is back. Mark, there was a question about spend on the clock tower and the, the future of the clock. 
Okay, I, I personally took care of the clock for maybe 15 years up until a couple years ago when what happened was, <clears throat> you probably don't know this, but the clock is run by a box of rocks. <laughs> Once every eight days, I would go there, I would crank that box of rocks up to the top of the tower and it would descend through, I think the third column from the left and I would go back in eight days and crank it back up. What has happened is the column has moved enough that the box of rocks is hanging up. And I'm not, you know, I could get a day or two and I wasn't gonna go there every two days to crank it back up. So um, I know the Masons are talking about reconstructing the front of the building, which is really what needs to happen in order for that box to last eight days. So that's why the clock hasn't been running for the last couple years, um, and it won't run until we get that straightened out. I also met a man last year who came to town and looked at the works of the clock. He's an itinerant traveling clock repair person through, for New England. And he looked at our clock, and he said, we have a very nice clock in very good condition. The works, the mechanics of it are very good. Um, because they were so old that they were before they were mass produced. So it's a very nice clock that we have. It's the George Stevens out of Boston. The works and everything are good. It's just a matter of making it last for eight days um, so somebody doesn't have to wind it every other day. Um, and I'm optimistic that we can um, get that straightened around. This itinerant clock person will be back through town in the fall and um, I'll have them look at it again. But until, until the tower, more than that, more, the column is actually running plumb up and down, we're not going to have a clock that's working. And I can go into detail about the, about the bell, but a lot of people that live close by are not excited about the bell ringing through the night. Um, and he's not here right now, the last person that talked to me about that. But, um, so that's the, that's the status at the moment. It is, it is right twice a day. Okay, is there any further discussion? Ah, yes. Oh, you... You've got to come forward, please. Thank you. Okay. I'm Lynn Sibley, and I don't know if I should be asking or making this comment at this time. Um, I know there was a comment about CLAs and appraisals of the town. Um, it's taken me a while to understand what that is. And I'm not sure if people know that the CLAs um, contribute quite a bit to our school budget. And, you know, I think that to understand, I mean, Johnson's at something like 70%. And as these CLAs go down, unless we have, you know, there's been talk about the, um, all the, uh, oh, help me out here. <laughs> all the appraisals that need to be done. Um, it, it's a significant impact on our budget and on our school budget. And, <laughs> You know, I will add that we had two meetings in the past three weeks, I think, on the school budgets. The first budget was pretty well attended. Um, there had been a student presentation, plus um, there was a dinner served. Um, I'm, Is that better? Oh, 
You know, I'm ready to just go. <laughs> Now I can't even remember what I was going to say. I'm, I'm going to go back to my seat soon, but just, and, and I know this probably isn't the right place to say it. At the first meeting for the whole district, um, no one made a comment after the presentation except for me. And it is very disconcerting to me that you know, these budgets are being decided in meetings that very, very few of the district um, residents attend them. I went to the second meeting about the budget, and there were five of us there. And they were all from Johnson. But that's just my little piece as far as Someone mentioned CLA, so unless you were like me and needed a lot of tutoring, I needed to understand the impact it has on our budget and why we're having to learn about it. So. So in, re in response to Lynn's um, a very appropriate question about CLA, um, what, what is CLA? CLA is common level of appraisal. I'm sorry. So that's a term that is used by the state education department when determining what, uh, what the statewide education property tax rate should be. And for every percent below 100% of common level appraisal, the tax rate goes up, okay? But what the common level of appraisal is intended to do is equalize the tax rates between towns. So if our CLA is low, our tax rate is higher, but if we're at 100%, Essentially, we'd be raising approximately the same amount of money under a lower CLA as opposed to a higher, closer to 100% CLA. So there, there is some penalty amount figured into that. The legislature last year did amend um, the, the law. It, it used to be if you fell below 75%, it was a mandatory reappraisal. What we found out with COVID and the change in land prices um, and sale prices <clears throat> is there were 135 communities faced with having to do a townwide reappraisal because they fell below 75%. So the legislature said, that's not sustainable. There simply aren't enough companies out there to perform the reappraisals. So they um, amended that. So that's what we're facing right now I may or may not be on the board at the end of today, um, but if I am, that's, that's one of the things we will have to look at is when can we get a company in to do a reappraisal and based on the fact that there were 135 last year and certainly more than that this year, that's gonna be a question we're gonna have to figure out is who can physically accomplish a reappraisal and when can they do it? Just give me a minute. <clears throat> we are allowed to take actions that appear in the warning. And to the extent that something that is not in the warning comes up as it is kind of percolating right now, um, it's very difficult to distinguish between when we're talking about the school budget and when we're talking about the town budget. And the only thing we're supposed to be talking about, as a matter of fact, I had a professor in law school who when he was unsatisfied with the answers he was getting from his students, he used to say, who wants to talk about what I want to talk about? <laughs> and uh, 
So here we are again, uh, same, same problem. Uh, I had thought about this uh, ever since I've seen this warning and what I have suggested, and uh, no one has yet said no, uh, suggested is that when we pass the town budget, the one that's the subject of this motion, uh, I was then going to, or will in fact, invite a motion to change the order of our agenda uh, to take up one item under other business. And that one item under other business would be the school budget. Now we can't have a motion on that subject, but in the context of other business, and we can talk about it. So that's what I have in mind. And uh, with that in mind. I think you said that all just for me, right? <laughs> Michael Patch. <clears throat> no, I, 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 I hate to tell you, but I, I'm, I want you to share it. It's, it's all okay. Um, I have just a couple name, questions for the board. Name this for the record. Michael Patch, I just said it. Anyways. I have a couple questions, and one of the topic most enemy doesn't want to hear about, but I'm going to bring it up because we just talked about five hundred thousand dollars for the police department, um, which they do a good job. And I'm not going to put you on the spot, I promise. Anyways, I want to know what people think about the crime in this town. I live in the Hicks and the Sticks, and I've seen more stuff in the last two years. I mean, in Johnson, it's here. I want this select board, if they approve this to do this, help Roger out, and he's not there to speak up for himself. We pay state dollars, tax dollars. We've had this in a select board when I was on the board about bringing this up and get our tax money that we pay to the state of Vermont to have the state come help them. There's one guy doing three towns for the sheriff's department at night. That's a lot of problems. And if you guys got scanners, which I know most of you guys do, because I've heard you call me, turn around and say, Yep, we heard that shooting at 9.38 at night. Oh, we just got drug dealers up on the top up there and they just burned the car. I mean, here you go, guys. It's here. Burlington, it's not that far. Look at the crimes, guys. We are talking the budget that you've got in here. Well, we were talking what uh, all the stuff and school board. I'm not going to bring up the school boards. Massive millions of dollars. I think the board should send a letter, whether it does do anything or not, saying, Johnson pays our taxes, we want our percentage too. If you can do Cambridge and Waterville and a lot of these other places, which they're helping them, we want ours too. And you're, ex you're talking about backups specifically. I am, I want them here just like anybody else. We pay our tax dollars, it's our right. Everybody else is there. So we wanna see them. Second part of that is, and that's what I would like you guys to do. You don't have to answer anything. I just want you guys to hear it. And I hope most of you people say the same thing. Hey, we're paying our tax dollars, let's help them out. I'm not saying take anything away from them. They just, was only so much we can afford. And we're already paying for something else for every towns. Let's get our cut. Second part of this part is um, delinquent taxes. I brought it up for years, delinquent taxes. Why are they not cleaned up? Used to be a couple of years, they posted it, it's gone. We're seeing them on there. Help me out, five years, six years? Yeah, they were. They have been extended since COVID, and we took action this year actually to do some cleanup on them um, just a couple months ago. I don't know, Rosemary, if you want to add anything to that. Uh, and we're in the process of setting up tax sales for some of those properties. But we're not going to go four or five years anymore. If you can't pay them, get rid of it. Uh, each year, the board looks at it and decides what action <coughs> they want to take. So I think the board is hearing you though. Well, I hope so. Yeah. And the last part of it is guys, you guys did a wonderful job through the flood. You guys, everybody in the town, you guys, the village, you guys did a wonderful job. There's no doubt about it. And I wanted to bring that up too. You guys deserve a lot. You really did a good job. And that's all I got to say. Thanks. Thank you, Mike. Any further discussion? I don't, okay. <clears throat> Is there a second on the motion to call the question? Second. I'm going to require, I'm going to request unanimous consent. That means and if you agree with 
going ahead and calling the question. You say nothing if you want to continue. Uh, you say you want to talk some more. Anyone want to talk some more? Seeing none, you, <clears throat> we have consent and uh, we move on to voting on the motion. And the motion is to authorize total fund expenditures for the operating expenses of $3,375,751.67, of which estimated $2,192,185.97 shall be raised by taxes and an estimated $1,073,565.70 by non-tax revenues. All in favor of that motion signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. I have it. The motion is carried. mentioned to you a short time ago, uh, we cannot in this meeting deal with uh, questions of the school budget because it's not within our statutory power to do that. Uh, however, it's not unreasonable, I shouldn't think, for questions to be raised or discussion to be had. So I'm going to request at the will of the group here <clears throat> that we change the uh, order of the agenda to move to a single item of other business at this time, discuss that for a limited period of time, and then return to the budget as uh, presented. Uh, so we would have one other business uh, item, and then we would, at the end of that, no motions can be made. It's simply discussion, and after a reasonable time, we move on to Article 6. Is there anyone who would? Okay, so there is a motion uh, for to change the order of the agenda. Is there a second? There's a second. Well, they, I think we could do other other things. It's pretty, it's pretty open. So okay. let's do, we'll do school now. Um, a school broad size now. And then we'll do other others. Other, well, when we get there. Okay. This so is just, this is just one okay. item. Okay. This is just one item other, other, other business. We will get to other, other business as elegantly put forward um, in its normal cycle. So, all in favor of the motion to uh, change the agenda to talk about the school budget for a limited period of time. All those in favor signify saying aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. no. Ayes have it. Um, so, who wants to talk about the school budget? If any. Hi, I'm Sue Lovering, and I have an observation about the school board budget. I have two observations. Uh, I did attend the school board budget meetings. I was really offended by the fact that nobody ever shows up to these things. Um, there's a lot I'm offended about, but we won't go into the whole thing. <laughs> uh, it's been said to me that, you know, you have to accept the budget because it's all about the CLA and the state directs everything we do and nothing you can do about it. Well, the bottom line I think is being missed and that is that the tax bill is becoming untenable. The school board budget is most of our taxes. I think 
the select board and the village work to keep expenses down just as hard as the school board seems to work to drive them up. Uh, in the future, right now we're talking about a 25% increase, I believe Walter said. Uh, in the future, they want a new facility and a new track, which are gonna be hit within a couple of years. The bottom line is, we got people on fixed incomes that are self-employed that simply can't pay it. And I go back in my mind to a teacher who said to me when we were talking years ago about building a new school, uh, I said, what if a person loses their home because they can't pay the taxes? And she said, I don't care, I want a new school. <laughs> there you have it. Uh, the other thing that offends me is that we got kids coming out of schools who can't add, subtract, or write, or spell. Give me a break. The U.S. has fallen behind in education. I think we should do something about it. Thank you. Michael Patch again. I'm sorry. I have a question that somebody can answer me. Uh, maybe can answer this question. Back about uh, before we joined this conglomeration of all other towns, Johnson had borrowed a million dollars to renovate this facility. I sat in this room right here and said, let's pay the million dollars back that the taxpayers of the town of Johnson put into this, we were gonna spend, which we didn't. And I was told, nope, we're not doing that. When we went and joined this, the million dollars went there. Did we end up paying that back? Or did, uh, as far as the town of Johnson, or did this conglomeration that we went into they help us pay that million dollars back? Or did we give the money back so we didn't have any debt? I think this is gonna be a Duncan, I think, or Rosemary. <laughs> I asked this question, I know. <clears throat> yeah, I think it's a school board question from somebody at the time. I happen to have been on the school board at the time, um, but I don't remember specifics, and I think Katie was too, and I don't know if you remember specifics. What I do recall, uh, at the time we voted for the unified district was that ultimately that it was presented as the taxpayers of Johnson would save money. Well, it turned out we didn't save money. Um, but um, in terms of debt, the whole district assumed debt, both assets and liabilities. Um, in terms of paying it back though, I feel like we had paid most of it back at the time that the merger occurred. A good chunk of it. No? Okay. You had a, you had a million dollars in your hands that wasn't spent because we didn't do the renovation yet. Um, oh, so, okay, I gotcha. We did put it in a capital reserve fund, in a capital reserve fund before the merger so that it was um, specific, uh, specifically allocated to school buildings and maintenance or something to that effect for the Johnson School. I know we put a pot of money uh, in the reserve fund that was dedicated because once you have a reserve fund, you have to spend the money based on um, the intent of that reserve fund. So we did put a big chunk of money. I'm sorry, I don't remember specifics. That was a long time ago. Uh, One thing and I'll let you get out of the hot seat. <laughs> That's so okay. the money it's my last day on the hot site you it's bring okay. it you've done a wonderful <laughs> job you really have thank you the point that i'm trying to make is so this money if it did go into a, a fund for in here so once we joined this thing where everybody was supposed to pay it we still had a pile of money that we can use for our own projects in the town yes it was specifically for the johnson facilities yes and why would we do that when we were with a thing to take care of all our debts by joining this. I wanted to pay it back, just give the money back, which we could, I already looked into it and nobody wanted to. I just oh, want I don't people know. to understand money. I don't know the money. answer to that, Mike. Okay, yeah. I just, I understand, thanks for taking the question, but people, money is real. Any other discussion? Wait a minute. I'm back. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, identify yourself to the record, oh, please. I thought, uh, Lynn Sibley. Thank you. 
Um, my concern with education funding is that it is not sustainable. And I spoke about this at length several years ago. I don't have the answer. I just know that with this year's increases, what are we going to do next year when we're faced with the same type of increases. The, the budget part of what we are doing this year is we're dealing with the CLAs. We're also dealing with the fact that I think about $900,000 of COVID funding has disappeared. And I think that they're probably great programs. Can this town afford to continue these programs after the funding goes out. And, you know, that's just my last comment, is that I just really find education right now in terms of budgets for local communities to be unsustainable. And I don't know who's going to finally say, boy, we need to do something. And the state's been struggling with this for years. Those of you who are around my age, remember, we've tried different funding proposals. But with the increases we're having this year, I don't think we've figured it out yet. And my only sort of goodbye message is how do we get this to change? Because I don't see education funding going down. Thank you. There wasn't, there isn't one. <laughs> There's no question to call. My, my watch is going to call it in probably about five minutes. I just have one comment. Identify. I'm Lois Fry. Thank you. And I've attended um, all the, pretty much all the school board, annual school board and budget meetings that I could since it started. One of the problems that I have found is that there's a real lack of communication from the school. One of the ways that that might be changed is if more people contacted the school and asked to get information out to us. <clears throat> we, didn't, we don't know when the school board meetings are, that you know, it drives me crazy. But I do know, because I've read in the Vermont Digger, I think, that the legislature is, um, has some people that are looking at forming a, a tax commission to look into how we fund education. And I think that that is sorely needed because as Lynn said, we need a change. And the only way we can get it is if people participate. I think it was mentioned there were 44 people at the annual school meeting and there were eight at the budget information meeting for all five towns. We have to get people thinking about how their dollars are getting spent. It's for the good of the kids as well as for the good of us taxpayers. Thank you. No, no, John, just wait a second. I'm your second line. How's it going? I'm Chris Turner, Johnson resident. So I just wanted to speak real quick. I'm also, I work with Lamoille County Sheriff's Department. I'm a school resource officer in Lamoille North. So I work in all the elementary schools, in the high school, the middle school. And uh, I just wanted to bring uh, attention to the fact that how COVID has impacted the students, all our kids. And there's a, a big dynamic change in the way behavior and learning is happening now, especially in the elementary age. Um, we're seeing a lot like second, third grade, um, just how COVID is impacted. So there's a greater need for teachers to be trained. There's a lot more teachers that don't wanna teach anymore. 
And so we have to attract and hold on to a lot of those teachers and, and everyone that's working in the schools. But as far as I understand it, and correct me if I'm wrong, a lot of the increase of the taxes isn't necessarily increases in, in uh, expenses, but it's how the, the CLAs are impacting all of our taxes. And uh, so I just wanted to bring attention. There's, there's a lot of increase in need in the schools that we didn't have three, four years ago that we now have. And uh, a lot of people that I know here work in the schools and I work with them. And uh, it's a tough time to be in the school system. And uh, so that's just the way I understand it is the increases from CLAs and not um, expense increases. But there is definitely a need to increase wages for school staff and to attract new talent and hold on to the talent that we have. Thank you. Thank you. John. Uh, my name is John Gregg, and I would like to just, with no hope in hell, just say I wish there could be talk about education and philosophy and spirit and why whatever the, whatever the statistic somebody quoted about how many graduating children can't read, can't write, can't spell, because there's got to be more about to this than taxes and CLAs. Otherwise, what the hell are we all doing here? And why do we need a new facility? And why the, oh, excuse me, uh, why the hell do we need a new track? Because if somebody can run fast when they graduate from the school, they could get old like the rest of us and not run fast. Whereas if they get an education, they might, as they get older, even approach wisdom. And the reason I say there's not a hope in the hell in this, it's sort of like saying, well, it'd be nice if people were kind to each other and we had world peace. It's about at that level of absurdity. But I just want to state something or put it in this meeting that education is really a lot more than money. Hi, my name is Olga, I'm a Johnson resident. I just wanted to speak very briefly. I'm a homeschooling parent, so I just wanted to represent that demographic of families that homeschool their children. And we don't receive any of the money that are taken out of our taxes um, for education. Um, but what I did want to say is um, quintessentially the most important thing I believe that's coming out of this conversation, and thank you for allowing it, is that we really do need to make an effort um, to attend the school meetings and the, the budget meetings and to ask questions. Um, and I would say probably one of the most appropriate things would be to um, attend these meetings and really try to understand and maybe even look into if audits are available to really understand where the monies are going. Um, if more of us do show up, um, whether we are parents of kids or just because we're residents, um, uh, I think that will make a bigger impact. Um, and the reality is that some of us are gonna get taxed out of this state. Um, many people are on fixed incomes or are lower income who by the grace of God were able to buy a house um, and aren't gonna be able to stay here and raise their families because if taxes keep going up, it's just not affordable, but thank you. I'm Walter Pomeroy. Um, didn't come prepared to speak on this, so I'll be a little disjointed, but the select board today has presented us a budget that's increased about 2%. The school board's budget is up over close to 15%. Every year we hear another excuse, another excuse, another excuse from the school boards and why these budgets keep going up. Lynn touched on it. They started new programs using one-time money, but the programs are now embedded in the budget. So 
we have a runaway train, not only here in this district, but in the state. The hardest thing to do in government sometimes is to say no. Our governments don't seem to be saying no. It is time for the people to stand up and say no. We cannot afford these tax increases. I'm sorry, I can't afford a $700 increase in my tax bill. I mean, that is just ridiculous. Um, and ultimately, it's going to impact us, it's going to impact Johnson, it's going to impact this state. It is time the taxpayers stand up and say no. So I urge people to say no. Thank you. LSO here. Um, has the board thought about, you know, like on my street, there's three houses that aren't coming back. You're gonna lose revenue. You look at Railroad Street, you look at all the apartment buildings. Um, have we thought about all this? Um, you know, eventually, a lot of these taxpayers are not gonna be here anymore. And have you compensated for any of this stuff going on? Because I'm gonna tell you now, we're not done flooding until the state wakes up and realizes what's going on. They gotta start doing something. And we keep paying millions, billions of dollars and keep doing it and it's just, it's gonna keep happening. It's just a matter of when. But I just, I don't know if you guys have thought about this you look at the apartment buildings on Railroad Street, they're all empty. They're trying to rebuild, but there's no guarantee they're gonna rent them. I mean, the landlords are only gonna put up with it so long before they're gonna say, we're done. They can't afford to do it. I just wanna know if you guys have thought about that. That's all. Thanks, Alice. Thank you. Yeah, um, I can't speak for the school and I can't speak for the state, but I can speak for the select board. And yes, we have calculated what we believe the impact to be on taxes for fiscal year 25, which is the proposed budget we just passed. Um, and we have um, included that in the revised numbers um, from the select board. Okay, time's up. Thank you all for participating. I can add um, that there, there are people in Johnson who are trying to address the issues, the flood issues which uh, have been presented and to uh, try to gather together communities in the Lamoille watershed to uh, take action that, such that if we do something in Johnson that affects Cambridge negatively, um, maybe we ought not to do that. And to look at the whole watershed as opposed to simply town by town by town. That, that is happening as we speak. All right. Um, where are we? Oh yes, shall we collect property taxes? <clears throat> Seems apt after this discussion. Article six, shall the town vote to collect property taxes to the town treasurer in four equal installments for 32 VSA section 4792 as listed below. With delinquent taxes and assessments having charged against them an 8% commission after the fourth installment, 32 VSA 1674, and interest charges of 1% per month or a fraction thereof for the first three months and thereafter one and one half percent per month or a fraction thereof from the due date of such tax, such interest shall be imposed on a fraction of a month as if it were an entire month per 32 VSA 5136. Payments are due in the hands of the treasurer by 4 p.m. on the below due dates. First installment to be paid on or before Monday, August 12th, 2024. Second installment to be paid on or before Tuesday, November 12th, 2024. Third installment to be paid on or before Monday, February 10, 2025. And fourth installment to be paid on or before May 12th, 2025. Is there a motion with regard to Article 6? 
So, Eric uh, Osgood moves uh, that as printed, and I have a second discussion. Oh, second. Okay. Sure, you don't want to discuss? No. Okay. <laughs> Seeing no discussion, if you're, your hand's up and I don't see it, wave it. Okay, I see none. And the, the vote, I'm going to request unanimous consent that I be allowed to move this to a vote without rereading everything that I just read you. Is there, <clears throat> is there that consent? Say aye. Yes. aye. Is anyone opposed and would like me to read it again? I see no hands. Good. Thank you. From the bottom of my heart, thank you. All those in favor of the motion as uh, presented signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. Uh, the ayes have it. Motion is carried. Go to Article 7. Article 7. Uh, will the voters of the town vote to exempt the Masonic Temple from municipal town taxes for a period of five years? Is there a motion with regard to that article? Uh, moved as presented. Is there a second? There is a second. Um, discussion? like a silent discussion. Okay, there being none, the motion is, is yours. Uh, the motion is uh, to exempt the Masonic Temple from municipal town taxes for a period of five years. All in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Those opposed, no. The ayes have it, motion is carried. Article 8, shall the voters prohibit the town constable from exercising any law enforcement authority in accordance with 24 BSA section 193A, open parens, small a, close parens. Is there a motion? We have a motion, is there a second? There is a second. Is there a discussion or explanation? Uh, Noel Dodge, uh, this is a technical cor correction, I believe. It's 24 VSA subsection 1936A, parentheses A. Very minor, but wanted to be correct. Okay, there's been a proposal to change the wording by deleting the first lowercase a and inserting the number six. Is that correct? Nope, just insert the number six. The two A's are correct. Oh, okay. So one, nine, three, six, A, A. Correct? Okay. Yes. Second. Who made the original motion? Eric, would you uh, agree to a change in your motion to uh, insert the six? I'll take uh, Noel's word for it, and I agree. And the second was from Doug Moldy? I would agree also. Okay, so now we're square with Robert's Rules of Order. Just in case you're curious, this is the latest edition of that. and. Uh, it has four, 714 pages, if you'd like me to read. Uh, then that's, a, that's up 10 from the last edition. So. Okay, so we've got a motion. It's seconded agreement to the modification of it. Is there any discussion of it? There? Yeah, Eric Osgood. Um, I know a number of years ago we uh, voted 
as a body to make it an appointed position versus elected. And there was reasoning for behind that as well. I was just curious if the board could address what, are the, what is the reasoning behind uh, removing any law enforcement uh, authority? I guess I got tagged. Um, Eric, you will remember that at the time that that uh, vote was taken to a point rather than elect, the select board actually adopted a job description for constables, which pretty much prevented them from doing law enforcement um, activities. So this really is codifying the job description, which has been in place for 30 years, almost 30 years probably. Um, it was brought to our attention that a constable, so the way the job description was written was um, they could not do it without um, law enforcement training through the law academy. Um, it's been brought to our attention, in, in, in the town wouldn't pay for that. Um, it's been brought to our attention that if a constable wanted to pay that fee themselves and get duly constituted as, as a law enforcement official, that they could then adopt or, or conduct law enforcement activities within the town. So this basically says, closes the door to that option. It, it really removes law enforcement capacity from a constable, from a statutory standpoint. Kim Dunkley, just asking if we wanna leave the door open then, we would vote no to this. Uh, the short answer to your question is yes. I guess I have to ask the question. We've already heard somebody mention it earlier. We've got crime problems. And what I'm looking at right now is you are basically shutting the door, locking the door, and preventing an alternative answer to our crime problems. Right now, you have the ability to appoint the constable. So you can somewhat address this issue. We may decide that the sheriff's budget actually needs more Either it's not the answer, or we may want to supplement the sheriffs because crime is getting out of an issue. If we pass this motion, it would require a special meeting or another meeting in the future to undo what we just did. Right now, I don't see we have a problem that needs to be fixed. But if we pass this motion, we may put ourselves in a position where we are in an untenable position where we have to do take actions to fix and solve our crime problems. So I don't see why we need this motion and I feel we should just defeat it and not try to fix something that's not broken and leave the door open for potential issues that may arise because of the crime issues. Thank you. Hi, Jackie Stanton. Um, I think I'm in support of this motion, but I want to back up because we've heard a couple of times now about um, this rising crime rate. And I'm aware that this is a perception that people have. What I, um, and I see it on social media every time, you know, uh, there's some shoplifting, whether it's at Get Yours in town or the Jollies, the post is shared hundreds and hundreds of times. And so I think that that kind of amplifies that perception. My question is, I haven't seen any data that supports this perception that people have. And I'm wondering if anyone has, or if that data exists, or if this is just a perception that people have. We get, um, the select board does receive, and the town does receive um, counts from the sheriff's department on responses to calls. I don't know if I've seen specific data from 
Lamoille County or for Johnson specifically. Um, I don't know. I think it is more subjective that I've heard, but um, we do have a couple of people from the Sheriff's Department in the audience. Perhaps they want to come to the mic. Good morning, my name is Sergeant Watson. I work for Memorial County Sheriff's Department and I do have some numbers, crime stats for the past year for the three towns that we patrol in. Since we're in Johnson, let's, since we're in Johnson, let's start with Johnson. Uh, there were 68 traffic accidents last year. There were 15 burglaries. There were 73 citizens disputes slash family domestics. We had 22 DUIs. We had 510 motor vehicle complaints. We had 13 noise disturbances, 23 sex offense investigations, 10 drug investigations, 29 thefts, and we wrote 124 tickets for a total fine amount of um, just under $24,000. Do you know how that relates from 10 years ago? I don't have those numbers. Um, I can tell you across the board that our numbers, calls for service and incidents have gone up. They have not gone down. Anything else I can help with? I'm sorry. I didn't... How does that compare to other towns? Uh, well, I'll give you all the numbers for our other patrol towns. In Hyde Park, 78 traffic accidents, one burglary, 37 domestic disputes or family fights, 21 DUIs, 562 motor vehicle complaints, seven noise disturbances, nine sex offense investigations, 12 drug investigations, 15 thefts, and we issued 95 tickets in Hyde Park for a fine am amount of just under 19,000. In Wolcott, 38 traffic accidents, one burglary, 23 citizens disputes family fights, 11 DUIs, 224 motor vehicle complaints, two noise disturbances, five sex assault investigations, two drug investigations, 14 thefts. We issued 43 tickets for a fine amount of just under 9,000. Any questions? Are there questions for the officer? John, go ahead. John, the mic. Just, just let me interrupt for just a second. Uh, the report of the Sheriff's Department on their activities in these three towns are located on page 83 of your... So you said overall things have gone up. That's up is between one and 100%. Could you be a little more specific? I mean, is, that seems to be the question as to, is this perception or is it statistical? It's statistical. Okay. I can't give you a, a specific. A quarter, a half, three quarters? I'd need to go back to the office and pull those numbers. I'd be more than happy to provide you with that information. Yeah. I'm just not capable of doing All right, that. But right what now. about your own daily experience? <laughs> Do you feel that you're seeing a lot more? Yes. Thank you. You're welcome. Michael Patch, he came up perfect timing. This is two parts. First of all, as a taxpayer in the town, I can't say that a constable, whoever it may be, would be the same thing as a sheriff or a state trooper. Now I'm talking about liability they make a mistake or they arrest the wrong person or they said something they shouldn't, I don't think this town's got enough money to fight it. We need pros. If we're gonna hire pros, then we sh start our own sheriff's department to help them. That's why I want the state to come. I am a 100% pro guy and I'd like his opinion on that. And the last thing I'm gonna tell you guys, I have lived most all my life in Johnson. And where I live, 47 Patch Road, I've seen two murders, two shootings, a rape, all within a mile. 
If you see what goes by, because if you come by my property, you look at the buildings, you'll see cameras. I see shit that you people don't. And I'm telling you right now, this isn't a joke. I see people that go on the road, they make me nervous. I took my grandson up into the Telton lines to go blackberry picking. And I called my nephew and a cops afterwards and I said, you guys gotta get up there. And they did, and they kicked him out. And I didn't even know mentioning what it was, but I'm telling you, it's here. So take it for a fact, this is a fact. And these people know, because I called them. But I'd like his opinion on giving a constable untrained a gun or whatever you guys are thinking to help them. That's just my opinion. Sorry for putting you on the spot. So this is, this is gonna be my opinion. This is not gonna be the opinion of the Sheriff's Department. Um, the training and the continuing training that you need to be a law enforcement officer in the state of Vermont um, keeps going up every year. And I think it would be very difficult for a constable to maintain that, that training. And the only way that a constable is going to be able to get the training that they need and the certification through the Vermont Police Academy is if the town sponsors them. You can no longer just show up at the police academy and go, hi, I'd like to go. Um, there's a much more stringent process than that. Any further? LSO here. I just got one question. Is this a paid position or is it a volunteer? Or? Um, we, it is hourly, it is paid hourly. Yes. It is paid hourly. So when he incurs hours, you pay him basically. Yes. Okay. Thank you. I opened the can of worms, so I just I, I just wanted to keep the door open on this by a no vote. I wasn't um, forwarding that we need one right now, and that has to happen. And it sounds like the training involved would be a whole other can of worms. But ultimately, to not shut the door. That was Eric Noose. Uh, I'm a retired law enforcement officer, game warden here in Lamoille County for many years, and I agree with Mike that this town does not want to take on the liability of being the oversight of a, of a law enforcement officer that we appoint. Uh, it's a very complicated job, way more than when I started up in 1971. And the other point that would make it very difficult would you guys, the, the select board would be the, the folks that look over this, uh, the activities of this constable. You really need a professional that knows the law, knows criminal procedure, all kinds of things to keep uh, somebody out of trouble. And A, all respect to you guys and gals, you don't have that, that, that kind of knowledge and you don't wanna take that on either. So I'm, I'm in favor of uh, passing this, uh, this um, uh, motion. Eric, I think you make a really good point, um, and I would, I think I'm right about this, but I would clarify that a, a constable would be allowed to enforce laws without the oversight of the select board. In other words, they could do it on their own authority, yet the town would be on the hook as far as any liability issues are concerned. So if there was a wrongful arrest or a civil rights complaint or anything like that, the town, you folks, would all be liable for that. Um, and the legal expenses uh, associated with defending such a suit would all be on the town. So I don't think, I, I totally agree with the professional nature of the thing. It should be professional law enforcement doing this, not a local constable. That's just my opinion. There's a, there's a motion to call the question. Is there a second? Second. Okay, not amendable, not debatable. All those in favor of calling the question and proceeding to a vote, signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. No. Okay, it's carried.
So we proceed to vote on the, the motion, uh, which was to prohibit the town constable from exercising any law enforcement authority in accordance with 24 DSA section 1936AA. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Those no. Well, rather than have a shouting contest, uh, all those in favor, please stand. Seated. All those opposed, stand please. The ayes have it, thank you very much. Okay, that moves us on to Article 9. Uh, that leaves us with 9, 10, 11, 12, and 13. We've been at it since a little after 9. It's a little after 11. Uh, what's your favor? I'm happy to give you a 10-minute recess to deal with whatever you have to. And uh, is there any objection to that? Not. Okay, how many would like the 10 minute recess? Stand up, please. How many want to keep going? He's a, he's a lonely, lonely guy. Thank you very much. <laughs> Article nine, shall the town establish a reserve fund to be called the paving reserve fund to be used for paving, paving maintenance in accordance with 24 VSA 2804 to be funded by any one or a combination of dedicated budget line item, year end balance from paving budget line items or reservation of year end budget surplus. Is there a motion? Okay, could the uh, person who made the motion stand please? Where? Oh, here. Oh, that's very important. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you both. All right. Um, motion is made and seconded. Discussion. This is about um, putting money aside to help with paving expenses so we don't get big, huge chunks of money coming out of our operating budget and affecting our tax. Instead, we can spread it over time. Kathleen Torrey. Sorry, I have one question. In that discussion about paving, is there any plans in the works for paving some of our dirt roads? Because I'm hoping you're not. I don't want my dirt road paved, and I know that had come up in the past as a discussion, so I'm just wondering if that's part of the planning process in paving budgets. I also don't want my dirt road paved. <laughs> um, and no, there aren't any discussions about that right now. I should add, um, there have been discussions in the past, and there's a new board coming in tomorrow. So um, for what it's worth, the current board has not discussed that. Uh, Al Beard, I live on Clay Hill, and I hear Clay Hill is mentioned today on being upgraded, a lot of money being spent. I'm just wondering whether uh, when they spend all this money, are they going to blacktop what they've just accomplished? Uh, there's no plans that I know of to pave Clay Hill anymore. Uh, there is ditching projects and stuff going on uh, using grant funds and some capital funds up on that side of town. Does that answer your question? Kyle Noose, along those lines, can we hear what the paving plan is for the next year or two. 
that's a passion project of mine. Uh, we don't we, we don't actually have uh, an up to date five year, ten year, fifteen year projection of the paving plan. Um, but given the money that there is, my guess is there won't be paving this year. And I'm hoping for some next year with a plan coming out of it of when certain roads were paved and what the plan is going forward. Well, yeah, there might be maintenance spots, but no new asphalt. No one. Oh, correct. I'm talking about like repaving sections. I'm not talking about additional mileage, if that makes sense. Uh, I actually spoke with Jason Whitehill this morning about this project on my drive in. Uh, it's where I get a lot of work done in this commute. Um, so the, the roads that look to be up right now are uh, Railroad Street and River Road East, um, which, um, and, and we're also looking at some other class twos. The paving is limited to what's called class two. Um, and we are applying, uh, Jason and I will be applying for a grant soon for 175,000. Um, to do that. Uh, whether that's going to come in in fiscal year 25 versus 26, I think it depends on the timing of when that award is. Um, but it's also an excellent segue to our next article of having um, a shared right of way with two municipalities that both own infrastructure within that. You know, that's an interesting thing, right? So, like Railroad Street, one of the issues is like, if we're going to pave it, we got to make sure we do the drainage. If we're gonna pave River Road East, we gotta sort out the drainage because you're not gonna pave something to tear it up, right? So the, that's like one of these projects that we have to work through those logistics. Um, I mean, we might just look at other class two roads as, as well, just to like, until that's resolved, you know? So these are like the things that we need to talk about as a probably a larger community for the next, next article. So um, we, we did at one point in time have an actual paving plan. Um, it's certainly my hope that we can reestablish that paving plan. Um, it's a critical, critical piece of information. For the immediate article, what's been happening in the past couple of years is um, we haven't been able to pool together a large enough project to deal with the money that we budget on an annual basis. So in, in a couple of years, we have actually held money over in the cash on hand and then applied a larger amount of money to a project. So this really is a way of sort of cleaning up that process, actually putting the money at the end of the year into a reserve fund so we can pool the money and do a bigger job in the future rather than hold it in the so you know the conceptually the town checkbook if you will yes. have a seat thank you it's been called to my attention that uh, representative excuse me senator westman and representatives noise and carpenter are in on the premises and would just love to come in and answer any questions you might have of people in the legislature. Can we call the order first? No. I got a motion. It's all right. I can come back. I can come back. Oh. Okay. I'm not. I'm not seeing any. Okay. I don't see any hands. Seeing no hands. All in favor of the motion was to establish a reserve fund called the Paving Reserve Fund to be used for paving maintenance in accordance with 24 VSA 2804 to be <clears throat> funded by any one or combination of the dedicated budget line item year-end balance from paving budget line items or reservation of year-end budget surplus. All in favor of that signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. No. The ayes have it. And we're still... We're still waiting for our senator and representatives. Come on.
the seniority and take us my job for incentives. You were just appointed to take over for me for the next little while. Yes. Okay. Hello, everybody. I'm Dan Noyes, and um, thank you for allowing us to be here today and talk. Um, I just wanted to start off um, with a concurrent resolution that we got honoring um, Beth for her service. And uh, so I brought a copy of it today for her. Um, it just is uh, the House concurrent resolution honoring Johnson Select Board Chair Beth Foy for her public service and outstanding municipal legislative leader offered by Representative Noyes, Representative Carpenter, and Senator Westman. Uh, in 2021, Beth Foy was elected to the seat on the Johnson Select Board and during her term, she served the panel um, as a chair. Beth found her time as the Select Board member to be personally fulfilling and highly informative. We talked to some people. And, um, and she was delighted to become acquainted with the many local residents who expressed respect uh, for the public service that the select board members perform on a daily basis. And whereas the select board member Beth Foy became familiar with many administrative aspects of local government, including grant funding and formation of municipal policies and the um, procedures of property tax assessment and reapportionment, uh, whereas topics on which she developed would uh, exp and expertise uh, were animal control, health inspection, winter salt, applications on highways, flooding, and major, uh, a major subject that given significant damage during the July 23 water deluge um, assumed immediate importance and was uh, one that she had not envisioned um, when she became select board. Um, a Johnson Select Board Chair Beth Foy demonstrated astute awareness of her community concerns and her polished leadership skills. And whereas after a term of service on the jo Johnson Select Board, Beth Foy is um, not standing for reelection and her leadership deserves high um, combination and therefore be it that resolved by the Senate and the House of Representatives that the General Assembly honors Johnson Select Board Chair Beth Foy for her public service and outstanding municipal legislative leader and be it further resolved that the Secretary of State to be directed to deliver a copy to Beth Foy, which she probably will do, but I got a copy too. <laughs> thank you. Um, some of this is very generous, <laughs> I'll just say, but thank you very much. So um, it's our annual town meeting report. Um, I thought what I would do is talk a little bit about where we are as a state. When I was home and I was talking and said to Joan what I was going to say, she said, boy, you're a downer. Um, but um, um, it's as somebody that spent a couple of decades on um, the money committee and the appropriations committee and the legislature what we're seeing is after COVID and after um, the huge amounts of money approaching two and a half billion dollars that um, we got in transfer payments back from the federal government and that money all going away, people are now having to move back into a situation where the only money we have is the money that we've got and we're raising ourselves. And it is, um, you know, rather difficult to get people to understand there isn't that amount of money out there. And, and it, it's dampering down everything that we can do. And that comes at a time when the demographics of the place are still moving in um, a direction that is making it more difficult. Um, we have in Vermont, 17,000 people less working than we did in 2010. And that becomes a problem when you're trying to squeeze budgets and the Vermont population is getting older. And quite frankly, as we get older and, you know, as somebody that turns 65 next week, um, we require more, um, 
um, home health services. We require more nursing homes. We require um, more um, general um, human services type budgets. And you get this clash between less people working, needing more revenue for the things to help people um, live dif dignified lives to the end. That's kind of the overall of um, the black clouds that are out there. And it's becoming, um, I think that between now and the end of May, when we get out of the legislature in the overall, this will rank as one of um, the most difficult um, periods of time to put together a budget that I've seen in um, um, my years in the legislature. Um, I think at this point, and in many respects, I think some of that same reflection is happening more at the local level as people talk about school budgets. So um, it, you know, um, it, it's be a, a difficult time as we move to a place where we get back to what um, is more normal in, um, than where we were before. So I'm Dan Noyes, kind of building on that. I serve on the Human Services Committee and we work a lot with um, Department of Disabilities, Aging and Independent Living, Dale. Um, and one of the things in budgeting, we're not the um, Appropriations Committee, but we make recommendations to um, the Appropriations Committee or to the Money Committees in the House. And they come to us around um, the policy and what's happening in residential care facilities or nursing homes and the pressures that are the um, the wages, what it costs to run a facility um, have really been adding up around these services and supports for older Vermonters across our state and to the tune in the budget adjustment, um, which is what we just finished last week, um, we had to um, we had to fund $17 million in extraordinary financial relief to nursing homes because there was about 12 of them that were going to go out of business if we didn't give them money. Um, because they're having to pay traveling nurses, they're having to fix the roof and um, the Medicaid reimbursement rates and the amount of money that they have coming in is so small compared to what the costs are that, um, you know, we're having to kind of prop them up. Um, and it's not just um, those nursing homes, it's, it's even the um, home health agencies and, and just being able to make sure that they have what they need to be able to provide services to older Vermonters has been, um, it's going to continue to be an issue as we move into the FY25 budget for sure. Um, you know, we do have some money we recommended around nursing homes and looking at the formulas that they're funded through. Um, but then at some point, there isn't any more money. So we've got to figure out how to make it work, especially for these small residential care facilities that are so uh, essential for providing care. Um, we had a rate study done and we're like 60% below what it actually costs to deliver the services. So there's no, it's obviously that they're gonna not be able to make it if they can't get the, um, the money in. So um, we also um, have been, um, Trying to think of, uh, been working on some legislation um, this year around the child protection services, around substantiation. Last year we looked at adult protective services. Um, so in committee, that's kind of the bill that's in the forefront right now. And my committee is looking at how um, children that have been abused or neglected, um, how the perpetrators are substantiated, and um, what the process looks like. It hasn't been updated in like 20 years. So um, every once in a while, these policy decisions come to our committee and we have a lot of, a lot of discussion on them. Um, and so that's what we've been working on in the last week. So thank you. Hi, um, my name is Melanie Carpenter and um, some of you may not know me because you didn't elect me. I was appointed at this time last year. And so this is my first cycle through, my first budget, my first BAA. 
Um, but I did get to meet many of you during the flooding. Um, our, our farm flooded and I got to be here working with the people in your town as well. And I've had the great fortune to work with the legislators behind me who are so wise. And so I'm gonna add a few things, but I don't have a lot of experience yet. But one of the things that I have seen in my short tenure there is a lot of creativity because um, as our Senator was saying, there's not new money coming, but we can be creative and we can be thoughtful about how we spend it and where we focus it on. So a few rays of light that I just wanna share that um, I work in the healthcare committee. And so we look at um, uh, mental health, physical health, uh, making sure that people have access to health care that is equitable, that is high quality, and is also affordable. And then we also work with lots of different agencies to do the work that we need in our communities. So a few highlights that I was excited about when we sent um, our budget adjustment in was to looking at um, how we look at workforce and how we use our money wisely. It was really exciting to see that 259 applicants happened in 2024 so far for the Vermont Nursing Forgivable Loan Incentive Plan. So that's something that has been happening for a while, but it's starting to get teeth in our state so that we can have a stronger nursing workforce to do the work that is needed for our communities. And that's helping also in-state Vermont students to be able to come to school to have their loans paid for. For every year of payment, you, get, you have to serve for a year in Vermont as a nurse. So it's really um, feeding two birds with one seed. So that kind of creativity I'm excited about. Um, also, there was a lot of conversation in our communities about public safety. And so, um, and how do we have support for our police, serve, our police force and also our community when there are mental health and substance use disorder issues happening on a call? And so we, in our budget adjustment, supported the governor's ask for five additional embedded healthcare workers to be in the police barracks around the state, bringing our numbers up to 12, and also funding support for our designated agencies that provide healthcare and mental health care to our communities. So those are some pieces that we've been working on in my committee, and it's been a pleasure to see um, people coming together to find solutions. So I look forward to finishing out the term and then seeing what else is needed for our town. Thank you. I was inquiring how much time these folks have for this meeting. They do attend a number of meetings in and around our area. And uh, they said they probably have 10 to 15 minutes. So if you have questions for them, this, uh, this is your opportunity. Um, Mike, go ahead. My question is mostly on the flooding. You guys did a good job. Thanks for coming. Um, in the world of floodings, which it's not a new thing. It's been happening millions of years. There is new projects out there in the towns that are putting in pervious. Burlington, I've done a couple of them if you've been to the Echo Center. The pavement that they do is pervious. Is there any way that the state or our select board could combine and start a project rurally when funding in that to find pervious? It's the same thing as pavement. Instead of water running off of it, it goes back in the ground. And in Johnson's case, everything in the village, uh, main stuff down through there, it would take a lot of water. Would it take it all? Nope, but it's gonna put some of it in the ground. Is there anything you know under new projects in this flooding that anybody's even wants to work with the town? I was going to ask the select board, but it didn't happen. But is there anything that you could find somebody to talk to our board for pervious pavement? Um, it's the first I've heard of it, um, um, or I'm happy to um, go back to the Agency of Natural Resources and talk with Julie Moore and see if it's something that they're working on. Um, I haven't heard anything about that. Um, I will say that sometimes the Natural Resources Agency is a little slow to get off the mark with new ideas, but um, I, um, I think the three of us would be happy to set up conversations to talk about that. Perfect. And then, like I said, the Echo Center and Norwich College both have them already because they're putting the water back in the ground instead of letting it run. Johnson would be a great candidate for it, but thanks. Yeah, and 
there's some new stormwater runoff regulations that are coming into effect that I've been getting a lot of feedback on. And in fact, my father-in-law's place had the driveway was um, pervious and it was like these cement blocks that had holes in them that they put grass in and it allowed the water to run in. And I think that we totally do need to start talking about that, especially when we're looking at half acre stormwater runoff regulations, you know, to, a, um, you know, to allow that type of development to not um, add up to the half acre or the three acre, which is the three acre rule. So yeah, thank you, no guys. doubt. I would just say the stormwater runoff has become a real problem to build in um, an expansion for our housing projects that we're trying to get moving. Eric Noose, I'm wondering if you could give us an update on what's going on with the college and the status up there. Uh, I go up there occasionally to play pickleball and uh, it seems pretty darn dead when we go up there. I don't know if there are any students up there anymore. <laughs> Um, so they are in the middle of this transformation plan where they've made a bunch of changes um, and they are um, starting to, you know, really reach out for enrollment and it definitely hurt them uh, enrollment by, um, you know, all the changes that have, have taken place, um, you know, um, definitely as that comes up in the legislative process, um, very interested in where their next steps are and how that's being implemented. They have a new um, new president up there, interim president that um, David Berg, um, who was there before. Um, so hopefully um, we'll see it pick back up to when I went to school there and there was, there was an awful lot of people there in 1985. So um, all the dorms were totally full. Hopefully we can get it back that way. Um, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but just last week um, we were listening to some people that were doing workforce development and they were talking about um, our campus here on Johnson and they were speaking about nurse nursing program and also um, dental assistant hygiene programs and different things that could maybe bring more students into our community. Um, and there's a lot of um, interest in that. And so I just want to like shout out to those two programs and also um, a mental health um, counseling degree that they're going to be um, propping up, which I think is really important to be able to get students here and wanting to stay here afterwards. So those are my only two pieces. Yeah. I, we are in the third year of the transformation plan that was out there. Um, we um, moved a year ahead in the base budget and funding for the um, in the transportation plan and this will be the third year for the one-time funds. Um, in the overall transformation. So on, on the money side, well, we're tracking all the way through this. Melanie's right. Um, the new nursing program that will be at the college will be the first um, master's degree program um, to train nurses. Um, you have to have at least a master's degree to um, start training um, an RN. It will be the first program opened in um, anywhere in this part of the country in um, quite a long time. Um, so at least in the last 10 years that um, that program, so um, they're hopeful that that will be on that. I think there's $6 million to do that. Um, what we, she's talking about for mental health, um, the cancer, campus here at Johnson educates the vast majority of the um, um, the mental health workers with a bachelor's degree across the state. Um, majority uh, at Lemoyle Mental Health, Howard, and the, all of the mental health agencies, um, what they haven't had is as strong a uh, master's degree program and that will be moving in there. I think part of the reason you might not see quite as many people on the campus is part of the in the transformation that we've done, a lot of it is um, for online classes and um, shared classes around the whole system now. So there's a lot more people taking online classes than there ever were before. Um, and that's to try to combat um, um, places like Southern New Hampshire University, which has put a lot of pressure on the state college system. 
Thank you, Sally Cole. Uh, thank you folks for taking the time to join us today. Um, I was especially struck by um, the topic of healthcare, uh, elderly, people leaving the state. Um, they're all relevant, very relevant. I'm glad to hear there's strides being made to take care of our elderly who deserve the respect. Um, and it would be nice to be able to think young people would want to stay in Vermont because they have a reason to. And I think for the majority, folks may leave, but they always, a lot of them seem to come back. But more importantly, I heard talk about law enforcement. I heard talk about flooding. Um, I've got great confidence in water resources and, and these other folks that are being paid to take care of this business. I wish I was an engineer. I would redesign the Lamoil River. I really would, but we can't. I guess, I don't know, maybe AOT needs to get some pressure. I don't know. What more concerns me is we heard about law enforcement, the rise in crime. We all know that's a reality. We know we've got huge issues with opioids and other drugs and alcoholism and depression. Does the state have any thoughts behind getting more trained alcohol and drug counselors, treatment facilities to coincide with that? to help us with these, they're drivers of crime rates, increased crime rates. And plus people don't feel good and the pressure's on the existing force that's trying to take care of them. So we've got master's degree in mental health. Are we thinking about increasing people that can help with drug help, alcohol counseling and rehabs? Thank you. And, and Maine comes to mind. They've got great stuff going on in Maine. I'm just wondering why we can't. Thank you. Just briefly, we have quite a bit of money coming in right now from the Opioid Settlement Fund. In fact, one of your selectmen is on the board. Um, so a lot of that is gonna be able to be utilized for um, helping with this opioid epidemic that we have. And now that we're seeing a lot more fentanyl and xylazine, um, it's way worse and it's just gonna keep getting worse until we can figure out how to get it under control. So um, whether it's prevention, education, treatment programs, you know, and the work Jenna's Promise is doing here in, in this community is, is really uh, important. So um, we have a long, we got a, a ways to go, but at least we're gonna start seeing more funding coming in um, to really help offset some of the costs to the communities. We've put a lot of effort into the Hub and Spoke um, program and um, all of the uh, addiction programs. Um, and even in this community, there's um, um, a fair amount of money um, going now to Jenner's Promise and, and all of those programs. Um, part of the problem is we can't train people fast enough to go into the workforce. And, um, and that's part of our issue, why we aren't moving along quicker within the area, um, that, but there is tremendous effort in those areas. Um, and um, to echo what Senator Westman said about the workforce and needing more um, people to actually do the work in those critical places, last week out of um, our healthcare committee, we're looking at those creative ways to find new solutions or to enforce the ones that, are, um, that have been thought of before that kind of need to be brought to the surface. And one was around peer support and finding a way to make licensure so that people that are working already in the fields of substance use disorder or mental health and are providing support that they can get um, a licensure that will allow them to draw down federal Medicaid money so that those programs can pay them to do the work and we can bring more people in. So that's something that um, is just a licensure and a certification change that we're working to try to advance this year. Um, Molly Zapp. Um, I was wondering if any of those opioid settlement funds were able to be directed toward the children of um, people with substance use disorder. 
um, I work at Lamoille Restorative Center, and I'm, I'm speaking for myself, not the organization, but you know, I work with youth who um, struggle with going to school, school attendance, um, and sometimes struggle with really big behaviors at school. And the vast majority of the kids I work with have current or historical substance use disorder in the household. And I'm seeing all these dollars, and, and like, so prevention is part of it, but part of it is really like, um, mitigating the damage that has been wrought on kids through their parents' addiction. Um, I mean, you know, people talk about, oh, kids aren't learning, kids aren't, um, kids are misbehaving in school. A lot of that is because of what they're seeing at home in terms of violence and uh, addiction. And so I'm wondering, like, yeah, we need money for kids to encourage them not to use substances, but also to, like, clean up the messes that have been wrought from the damage that has already been inflicted? Um, yes, it's just getting started in terms of how the money is gonna be allocated. Um, and we're still expecting more to come in from other manufacturers of opioids that are um, liable for this, that cause this. And so I think as this gets up and going, we'll start to address these because these are adding to our education costs and our um, mental health for our children, um, and you're 100% right that you know this is the kind of thing that we need to um, really think about the greater impact it has. Also, helping the people that are um, you know ad addicted, but also trying to figure out how to help um, their families. So, <laughs> and Shane's on the board. So. <laughs> Yeah, I just want to be specific about um, what Dan is talking about there. One of the things that the overdose, uh, the Opioid Settlement Advisory Committee, I confuse the name sometimes, um, recommended to the legislature for funding was additional uh, student assistance uh, prevention specialists, yeah. I think is the exact name. Um, and these are school-based prevention specialists who will work directly with people um, who, you know, whether they are experiencing it at home or there are other problems that they need help with to, to prevent um, but it's about getting in front of the problem rather than dealing with the problem uh, and all of the resulting problems down the line yeah definitely how do we reach upstream try to catch it before we get hi uh, my name is athena park uh, and i just want to advocate uh, for affordable housing when we think about uh, the demographics, right? And the number one thing that I've noticed in driving young people out of the community, it's not lack of jobs, it's not even high taxes, it's the lack of affordable housing. And when you think about the rental stock in this town and how it was drastically damaged during the flood and how that sort of trickles up into the rest of the housing market, it's a, a huge issue. And so I hope when we're thinking about uh, keeping young people in the state, we're really thinking about that because that is what I'm seeing driving people out. Thank you. I just want to say before Melanie leaves that Melanie spent many hours in Johnson helping flooded families. So thank you very much for all the hours that you spent in our community. We did the reserve fund, right? So let me just turn. Okay. The, uh, the next item on our agenda is uh, number 10 and 11 is kind of linked to it. I really don't want to separate those two. I expect the conversation to be lengthy and I hope enlightened. Uh, I've also been told very special news by the pizza maker that uh, it's ready and it's hot. So I think um, I'm gonna 
button it up for lunch and uh, let me see if I can find out what the schedule is here before we disperse to reassemble at uh, one o'clock. Okay, can we come to order, please? We are now proceeding to <clears throat> town meeting article 10. And before I start on this, <clears throat> I was approached during the lunch break by a, a woman who is uh, looking after the children upstairs who very much wanted to be a part of the, the vote on this, on this article. And since she is performing a public service for all of us, I told her that I would uh, send for her when we were about to vote. So is there any objection to my doing that? I'm seeing none. Onward. Article 10, <clears throat> shall the voters of the town of Johnson authorize their select board to prepare or have prepared and act upon a preliminary plan for merger uh, with the village of Johnson in accordance with the provisions set forth in Title IV of VSA Chapter 49. Do we have a motion with regard to Article 10? Did you ask for a motion yet? I asked for a motion. I'm not up here just to give a motion. Oh, okay. So well, just wait. just wait, wait a second and Thank I'll get you. one. Okay as I read it. I'll second it. Okay, hang on for a second, and that's been a second, okay. Okay. Oh, all right, Is, can you hear me in the back now? Okay, I'll just stay closer to the mic, and if I, if I don't start waving at me, you can hear? Okay. All right, so we have a motion. Yes, Joe. Thank you. Uh, when I first heard about this merger... Uh, Name? Identify yourself. Oh, Jeff Corey. Nice to see you. Uh, <laughs> when I first heard about the merger, you know, I was very confused about it, and I'm more confused now. When you come up and you write an article dealing with merger, and let's pass something that's called a merger. I don't really have a definition of what's happening. In other words, I don't know what the town is gonna to gain by it. I don't know what the village is gonna gain by it outside of having a united select board or something. And this is the $60,000 question. I just, and it's too bad they both weren't together, but that's okay, they'll be coming. And I expect I'm just talking to the wind right now but I want you to know I'm, I'm very confused about this, and if some people that are for it can itemize a little bit what brought what they think will be gained by this, or oh, lost, for that matter. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the question, Jeff. Um, so I, you know, I don't think. Anything I'm going to say is going to change anyone's mind that's already made up on it. Um, I, I'll speak as myself, um, and I, I think there's broad information that is representative of the board's position, but I'll, I'll include that in this. Um, part of the reason that this was brought forward was because a lot of us have the same questions that you're asking about what are the benefits, what are the downsides of a potential merger. Um, this is a question that predates my time on the board. Um, previously, both sides have approved having a conversation about a merger. Uh, that conversation has kind of taken place in fits and starts. And in my own opinion, I don't believe we have all of the information needed to come to a, a full decision on the issue. Uh, so that I think is what you gain from voting for this uh, this proposal 
is more information about the pros and cons of a merger by going into what each side might stand to gain and lose through that, that plan. I know, but you just can't come up and say, oh, let's have a merger. I mean, there's gotta be reasons for the merger. That's all I'm getting at. Can someone speak to what can be gained by a merger for the village and the town? I'm simply putting down someone who can talk or itemize some of these. Otherwise, why bring it before us right now, this year, if you can't show this type of thing? And we don't have to wait for a preliminary plan. I'm asking preliminary questions about this plan. What I would answer to you is that this, this plan is seeking to answer those questions that you're asking. I don't know, you know, and if anyone wants to volunteer, they can. I don't know that any of us or any of the trustees can give you full information on what it's, you know, what either side stands to gain and lose. Then why bring it up? <laughs> Jeff, Jeff, Jeff. No, just stay where you are. You're good there. This isn't tennis. We're not serving and volleying here. You have a question, pose the question, allow the answer to occur. If you want to be recognized again, put your hand up, okay? Okay, well, maybe, maybe not. You never know. Just chill. Okay. I just want to read something really quickly um, um, for information for everybody here. Um, Duncan put this together. I think it's good. Um, the select board agreed that it's good information for everyone to hear um, before additional conversation occurs. Um, so the Johnson Select Board was served with a petition to include the following article in the 2024 town meeting warning. The petition had the requisite number of signatures as certified by the town clerk. Accordingly, the article appears in the 2024 town meeting or warning as Article 10, and you know what it reads. We just approved, the, we just created a motion to discuss. Um, since the article was submitted by petition, the select board feels that this article is properly the voter's article and takes no official position. The article should be discussed and decided by the voters in the best tradition of town meeting. Article 11 was added to the warning by the select board as a companion article in the same manner. Um, it seeks to clarify what actions the select board should take if Article 10 is approved. If Article 10 is approved, Article 11 proposes the amount of funding to be added to the amount raised by taxes, unless there's another funding source, and clarifies that raising those funds would be contingent on the village uh, voters approving a similar article. The select board believes that hiring a neutral third party to develop a preliminary plan, if approved under Article 10, is, appropriate, is an appropriate step and supports the article. If Article 10 is defeated, Article 11 can be passed over. Article 11 reads as, shall the voters of Johnson authorize the town to raise appropriate and expend 60,000 for the purpose of Article 10, contingent on the voters of the village of Johnson approving a similar article to Article 10. While the select board is not taking a public position on Article 10, we believe some basic information in the article is warranted. Below is the language for a prelimi preliminary plan, as well as what a plan, is, uh, what a plan is required to contain. It is important to note that a preliminary plan must be approved by the legislative body, the select board, and the trustees before being um, promu promulgated. I don't know the word. Uh, actual merger requires additional steps as found in 24 VSA sections 1484 and 1485. In summary, at least two public hearings for each municipality, town and village in this case, are required. Majority vote approval by Australian ballot of both municipalities would be required. It also requires approval of the Vermont legislature. Below is the language regarding the, the preliminary plan. Um, 24 VSA section 1482 preliminary plan is, a plan of merger shall be prepared 
which shall be approved by a majority of the legislative body of each of the parties to the proposed merger before being promulgated. Um, contents of the plan um, per VSA, per 24 VSA section 1483. The plan of merger shall include provisions related to structure, organization, functions, operation, finance, property, and other appropriate matters, shall include special provisions contained in a charter of any municipality included in the plan, which provisions are, uh, which provisions are particular to the municipality and of which is desired to retain as a charter provisions of the consolidated municipality and shall include the adequate provisions of the satisfaction of all obligations of the parties concerned. Basically, um, both the assets and liabilities are, are combined. The plan shall provide that any area or group of voters in the consolidated municipality or town have special services not common to all the voters in the municipality or town provided for them if so voted. All costs of whatever nature required to support these special services shall be paid by the taxpayers receiving these services by a tax on their grand list to be assessed annually by the, tax, by the select board or equivalent officers of a municipality or in such other manner as the select board or the equivalent officers of a municipality shall determine. If the costs are to be paid by tax, such tax shall be paid and collected in the same manner as other taxes, and such tax assessed on the grand list shall be a lien thereon. Um, and then it talks about the amendments to this particular um, statute. With this information, the article is yours. The select board will do our best to honor the wishes of, uh, the, wishes of the voters. Thank you. Um. Quick question, how did the amount of 60,000, Olga, how did the amount of $60,000 um, get established? And then secondly, um, would it be possible to fund the study outside of raising taxes, for example, uh, crowdfunding or fundraising where people can voluntarily contribute to it that doesn't raise property taxes. So I feel like we're mixing articles a little bit, but the question was pertaining to Article 11 and the cost. Um, I reached out to CGR, which did the preliminary study on about what a plan would cost or well it was a study this is for a plan and they came back with a rough number of sixty nine thousand dollars plus seventy five hundred dollars for an extra meeting um and kind of said if you were to budget eighty thousand that would pay for a merger plan uh, and the select board in a meeting uh comparing grand lists of the town and village and population and a couple other things said, you know, to be partners, we would propose to the voters $60,000 expenditure under the assumption if the village were to receive a similar article, maybe they will carry the $20,000 to get us around 80. There was one other firm that Duncan reached out to and they came back off the cuff guess at $50,000. So that's where the number came from, but that does not pertain to Article 10. This is going to be, it's Michael Patch. It's, uh, this is a three-part thing in there. This is going to be to Duncan, it's going to be to Rosemary, and it's going to be to Eric. I know you're not on there, Eric, but you got a good memory, I think. So over the years, there has been many discussions of merger. Sometimes we got it in select boards. Sometimes it was approached with different bodies of people at the time. I wanted to know an answer. What, yes, I understand the petition in here, but with the history of Johnson, um, and we've met, discussed it before and it's never gone anywhere, wasted a lot of time. Why wouldn't we have just turned around, put the two boards together in a public format twice, the same thing, and then decide if it's even worth spending the 60,000? That's the first part. 
And this is to these three. How many times have we brought discussions of a merger up, even if it was just in the select board when I was on or out in general over the last 30 years? Does anybody have a rough idea? I know you guys are on it because, yeah. To answer the first part of your question, um, both boards have met in the past two years uh, on a couple of occasions to talk about what it would mean for merger. We talked about really high level, um, quick and dirty math. And we also talked about um, getting lists of assets and that kind of thing. Um, so there have been some discussions which are available in minutes on the website. I can't speak to the second half. Eric, Duncan, Rosemary. Yeah, go ahead, Eric. <laughs> Let me take my shoes off to help you count. Yeah. <laughs> Brush out the cobwebs a little. Uh, Eric Osgood. Uh, I, I think from what I can recall, it seems like this first discussion happened early 90s, and that was the discussion of a merger. And I think the I think the bodies, one or the other, maybe both, decided not to proceed. The early 2000s, it came back again, and uh, we had two board members, one from the trustees, one from the select board, Howard Romero and George Perlman, that did a off-the-napkin uh, pros and cons, and they came back with a recommendation that we not merge. And then this discussion now has been really simmering for about three or four or five years maybe, and I think that's where we are now. So I'm recalling about the first time the discussion came up was back in the early 90s. 70s is the first one. Okay, yeah, that's before my time. Not yet. Uh, hi, I'm Margot Warden. And um, uh, with Article 10, you know, I've talked to a lot of folks on current and past boards, both the trustees and uh, the select board, and was just really trying to suss it, you know, all out. Um, and what really helped me and I believe that I am in favor of Article 10, I, I know I am, was something that was posted uh, by Donna Griffiths on uh, Front Porch Forum on February 27th. And Donna, it, it is public. I mean, could I just read part of it out loud? Sure. Okay, thanks. I won't read the whole thing, but uh, it is available still on FPF. Um, here we go. So from Donna, I've been taking meeting minutes for the Johnson Select Board and Village Trustees since 200, 2012. For 12 years, I've gone to every meeting of both boards, and that gives me a perspective not many other people have. I'll, I'll skip some. Um, the current structure doesn't make sense. Almost nothing the village trustees are responsible for affects only village residents. The village fire department serves the whole town. The village electric utility has customers outside the village. And those customers have no say in electing the people who make decisions affecting their rates and service. The village sewage utility has customers outside the village. Maintaining sidewalks and storm drains downtown is a village responsibility, but it benefits everyone who goes downtown, not just people who live there. And she highlights a couple of other uh, similar situations. Um, and I'll conclude with, and the current structure is too complicated and inefficient. Village and town responsibilities are so interconnected that many decisions and actions require the involvement of both village and town. It's hard for the two boards to find time to meet with each other, and they have an incomplete understanding of each other's operations and priorities. It's a recipe for slow action, miscommunication, and conflict. Nearly every meeting of either board includes issues that could be dealt with more quickly and easily if there were only one board that, or that wouldn't even exist if town and village were merged. So I uh, thank you, Donna, um, that provided great clarity. And um, it was important to hear from somebody who really, while you're the note taker, you're not an elected official. You, and you know, 
sometimes we hold on to things if we're like an elected, like a, a trustee or a select board and change is hard. And I think um, this was a pretty good answer to my questions. Thank you. Offie Wortham. Um, you know, the way everything's under the microscope about the money is very, very good. But I can't comprehend uh, the $60,000. You know, I've been involved in some things over the years, different governments, et cetera. Uh, where did it come up with? I mean, who decided $60,000? How's, how's the uh, person going to be picked or allow, company that's going to get allow, this money? What, why can't allow me to interrupt you, sir. Yeah. <clears throat> What you're talking about is perfectly uh, apt if we're discussing Article 11. Hmm? Article 11 is the article that, that talks oh. about the 60,000. We're still on Article 10. Okay, so I'm not on that yet. Not yet. We, okay. And we will or we won't. I will find that out fairly soon. Okay, anyway. Okay, Mike. Thanks for recognizing me. Michael Patch. Um, one thing that really, um, Margo, good point, good notes on what you've seen in there. We have seen this for years. It's not just since you've been taking notes about being one board managing the other board and blah, blah, blah. It's, we've seen it for whatever. My recollection, and it's just mine in there, is I would want to see the select board and the village board sit in a meeting and say, 100%. We want to do this and then come to the taxpayers, not paying anybody for this, then come to the taxpayers and say, we've got a plan and spell it out to us. Save the 60 grand. You've got a year to bring this up. Put it on until next year. I'm not going to table it. I'm just saying put it up for one year and the boards meet and agree the same thing they have in past when they knew there was an impact. They weren't going to agree. You've got the dollars and cents in it. You've got your stuff all done. You've got two boards that meet every month or twice a month. They can figure this all out before we spend 60000 If for some reason this does work, great. But if it doesn't, why waste sixty grand to find out we're going to be in the same boat when it comes down through because we have not researched it very deeply. That's my take. And I, in the past, and just my opinion, just like Margot gave hers, I don't think it's going to work. But that's just me. And thank you, guys. Okay. Let's 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 try to stay off. <coughs> excuse me, the sixty thousand. <coughs> that is part of Article Eleven, not of Article Ten, which is what we're dealing with now. Oh, all right. So let Offie. He's been. Oh, wait, I'm sorry. Okay, Offie. Yes, fifty thousand. Okay, settle it. Okay. Um, so I just wanted to say that I understand some of the cons being that we're, um, the way that we're structured, we have the water, electricity, I'm not the person to know it all, but I know that there's some things about the village and the town that, that make it work the way it is now. I wanted to say that for me, as a, as a, rep, as a person who lives here, the biggest thing that I want to see from our town and village is that there's a community of people who are, are able to help you when you call up and you're in need that they don't say, sorry, that's the town, or sorry, that's the village. That, they, that you answer the phone and that it's one connected community and that people are able to reach out and help you out. And that hasn't been the case in the past. And to be able to have boards that are willing to help make those connections and work together to solve the problems that we have in Johnson. Thank you. Okay, off me. okay, I'm back to the sixty thousand dollars. No, you're not. No, you're not. We're, we're still on Article Ten. Yeah. Were you pointing to me? Yep. Okay. Uh, so name? Uh, Chris Turner. Just reading through Article 10, I'm having trouble understanding it. It sounds like it was mentioned that Article 10 is to allow us to create a plan to merge. But the way the verbiage reads is confusing because it says it allows us to prepare 
or have prepared and act upon a preliminary plan. So is it to create a plan? Is it to act upon a plan? Because the way it reads is it saying it's both. And a follow-up question is voting yes on 10, does that commit us to a merge? I'm hesitating a little bit because I'm re -re I just reread it a couple times as you were speaking. It is about acting on creating a preliminary plan, not about acting on merging. Charlie Gallanter, I am opposed to giving the select board any more duties. They, uh, they meet twice a month, I believe, now, and they have a heck of a lot on their plate, adding the fire department, the electric department, the water and the sewer to their plates. I think it's asking too much of five essentially underpaid volunteers. And uh, so I'd be opposed to any further, just any movement in the direction of a merger. It feels like a long last walk getting here. Um, the, um, Doug Moldy. Uh, I've had in my office for any number of years the uh, charter for the village, and the charter for the village and its relationship to the town are dysfunctional. The town has responsibility for all the streets in the village. The village has responsibility for sidewalks, storm drains, curbs. That essentially means no action. If you're trying to get Railroad Street done, you're not going to get Railroad Street done with any period of time that would adequately serve serve the public. Similarly, with any number of, of issues. Um, preparatory to this, uh, I copied and read through all of the uh, materials related to the last go-round where Kent Gardner of CGF or CGR did a, did a study. Now, there has been some uh, discussion or I've seen circulated information and I would simply tell you that uh, with regard to any studies they've been done, they're completely inadequate. No studies have actually looked into the amount of cost saving to avoid the duplication that we presently have. They haven't looked into the question of how we, how we uh, are, are arranged and what our separate responsibilities are. You are the, uh, they've essentially been, uh, we, the last one, the, the original bid for it by the only person who, in my opinion, when I was looking at it as a select board member, was a competent organization, was 32000 The village came in with $4,000. The town ended up, I think, putting in 6000 We renegotiated and got a, a, got a proposal and uh, a report that essentially said this. You have a joint village town manager you're, you're you're cooperating you're getting along there was no there was no look at any cost savings or any duplication there was no look at how things would work better given the dysfunction of our original setup which has been there for a hundred years you know I I am very hesitant to say that I would vote for a plan if it came forward because it depends on what's in the plan but this with our with our communities suffering the economic problems that we have, we really should look at the potential cost savings that we might have in the future. And I would tell you that seeing as I've seen numbers bandied around it, but we've got, uh, we have millions of dollars of this asset, millions of dollars of this asset, it's way above our respective board's pay grades to do this study themselves. Ken Taranjo, and I'm also the trustee chairman. Um, so I disagree with Donna a little bit on the overlapping of stuff. Since I've been chair, I've worked very well with the chair of the board. A lot of the stuff that comes up that people say they have to go to one board and find out they got to go to the other. 
simply could be resolved by calling the clerk's office since how there is not a joint manager we have separate managers um, it's easy to find out who controls what simply ask <coughs> committees committees have to go to one board and then the other most of the committees that the town has have prior members of the select board or trustee board on them and some current ones so that statement should be irrelevant because if they don't know who the hell would know um, the expense there's we've already spent ten thousand plus dollars on a study now we're asking for the town to spend 60 and the village to pick up another 20. there's kicking the can down the road or there's continuing to fix small problems um, i know beth and i have had many conversations and when it comes to a joint uh, decision we acted quickly put them on the agendas and dealt with them i would dare say and i think eben might agree so being on the emergency management with eben and beth you guys went to want to dealt with the village situation during that time would you you had enough to deal with and together we dealt with it i think rather well served our residents very well yep there's always problems that occur that should have could have should have could have and possibly been dealt with different but you got to look at one thing and one thing only are we going to keep spending money to try to make a few people in this room because most of the people in this room I have an assumption is for this. There's a lot of people that work during this time and period that cannot come and talk about this, who I'm sure would have difference in opinions, but we need to actually look at the overall goal. So a merger is going to what? It's not going to take the utilities because the state won't let that happen. That would go to a utility commission. The select board isn't going to have control of that. So all in all, we're going to spend all this money and people say there's no guaranteed tax increase. Coming up with $60,000 is a guaranteed tax increase. Any official that tells you that there's probably going to, going to pan out, it's going to even out, is being very irresponsible. We were told this marriage is school. It's going to be a benefit. It's going to be a reduction in our costs. Has that happened? Have you ever seen any merger happen where there's actually been a reduction in cost. Ask Waterbury. It didn't reduce anything. Yes, they merged. It cost their residents more money in the long run. So in all in all, we're gonna to continue to fight over what? Control the sewer or the, the wastewater drain system, the sidewalks and the fire department. We have one of the well-oiled fire departments in this small county. I think all of you can look and remember what they did during the flood. I've seen several flood victims who were firefighters who were out rescuing my daughter off Railroad Street from the second story apartment. Why well, their house was completely flooded. They didn't go back for 18 hours. It carries over and over and over. And as we said, this has been going on since the 70s. It keeps coming out. There's going to be a tax increase no matter what happens. It costs money to make this happen. There's not going to be much improvement because there's going to be one side arguing for one thing to happen, the other side arguing for the other thing to happen, as it does all the time. I just wish people would really consider the fact that we have a big expense coming up in school budgets. The state does not consider our costs of livings and everything else. Their increase, the energy Buying renewable power increases everybody's costs all the way around. Not saying that stuff shouldn't happen, but when it all happens in the seven, eight year span, and we're trying to keep people in this town and community, it's not gonna happen. Walter Pomeroy, I'll preface my comments by saying I was a village trustee for 16 years. 
I'm going to read you first something from the only independent study that has already been completed on the merger study, okay? This is available on the website. This is their conclusion. Public services provided to the Johnson community have evolved over time with some provided by the village and some provided by the town. Many services are already shared for which the community should be commended. The division of responsibility is quite complete and we see very little cost duplication. An independent voice has already done a preliminary review and they have basically did not find anything that was quote, needed to be acted upon or was of dire consequences. So ultimately, the village of Johnson was created in 1894 to provide some basic services to people in the downtown area, primarily utilities. That's what the village does. And the village does this very, very well in a very cost-effective manner over many, many years. For those of you who don't understand the village, the village may be smaller in square footage than the town, but the village budget is $3.8 million. The town budget is only $3.4 million. The village is actually a bigger operating entity than the town. So this just isn't, oh, we'll take over a few sidewalks and a fire department. We are talking about a major, major transformation of how things are done around here. And if you get into utilities and all the contracts and all the ownership assets related to the electric department, as it was read earlier, that is going to be expensive. That will have to be paid by taxes. It did not say the law does not say ratepayers. The law said taxpayers. So all those costs are going to be eventually be borne by the taxpayers of this community. So ultimately, the village, if people would just let the village do what they want, what the village does and does well. The village does a few basic functions and does it well. The community has elected people to run the village. These people follow the village voters. Ultimately, people keep coming to the village trustees and say, we want you to do more. We want you to do more. The trustees have said no. They keep getting elected. They keep getting said no. People say there are squabbles. People say there are disagreements. Time is spent. Leave the village, let the village do what the village does. Let the town do what the town does. Already we've just heard, oh, we're going to expect the village to pay $20,000 towards this. Last time was the community development director. Oh, we expect the village to do this. That is not the village's responsibilities. That is the town's responsibilities. Sep keep the two separate. We'll let one do what the other does and let one do what the other does. And then those squabbles will go away. Or those squabbles will just move to a different venue. The select board meetings, these meetings, these could all get longer and more contentious if we start, if we combine these organizations. The village has operated for hundred and almost 30 years now and has done its job very, very well. It has represented its owners and how many people can say owners about their electric department, about their water department, about their sewer department. The largest percentage of the people are both residents and voters. Yes, there are a few outside. We listened to them, or we did listen to them. I can remember sitting in a room with the Sinclair Street people about water and sewer. So they are not immune and do not ignore the people outside the village boundaries. But primarily, the village trustees and the village taxpayers and the village ratepayers are all one and the same. Leave the, the utilities as is, leave them be, let them do what they do, they do very well. How many people can go to the president of GMP and complain? You can go to Ken and meet him in the, well, if we had a grocery store, you could talk to him in the grocery store and tell him your, your two cents. 
So ultimately, if people would just let the village do what they do and not try to make the village do more than what they do, these squabbles would disappear. They would go away. That is the problem that if there's any problem at all is people keep expecting more out of the village. They keep getting told no. They keep getting told no. So what's that left for them to do? Well, we'll just kill the village. I'm sorry, I don't like what Texas votes, but I'm not gonna try to kill Texas. So let's not try to kill the village. Let it do what it does. Because ultimately, the taxpayers are going to lose in this situation, both in the short term and the long term. So I hope you vote no on Article 10. Been a motion to call the question and second it if you wish to. We haven't called the question yet. Question. <clears throat> All those in favor of uh, calling the question, which will end the debate, signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. 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 Ayes have it. I have a request for a paper ballot. Uh, will you stand, please? Can we? Can we have just a second? Can we have uh, uh, other people who wish to paper ballot? Seven. Need seven. Okay, so we're going to do a paper ballot here, and we're setting up to do that. Uh, what that will involve is uh, you folks forming a queue, a line, going over to the uh, table by the doors where you'll receive a ballot when you're checked off the checklist, uh, mark it, yes or no, uh, and we'll send some people around with little boxes to collect your uh, executed ballots, and then we'll check them. So the, uh, these polls are now open. You can line up. Okay, here are the results of your voting. Can I have your attention, all of you? There were 104 ballots cast, 51 yes, 52 no, spoiled one. The article is defeated. You know, you hear this all the time. Every vote counts. Really, every vote does count. Okay, that uh, alleviates Article 11. Article 12. Shall the town of Johnson vote to raise, appropriate, and expend the sum of $1,500 for support of River Arts to provide services to residents of the town? Is there a motion? <clears throat> it's been moved and seconded. Did, uh, did anyone not hear the reading of the article? Okay, again. Shall the town of Johnson vote to raise and appropriate and expend a sum of $1,500 for the support of River Arts to provide services to residents of the town? Is that audible to all? Thank you. Motion. Do I have it? Did I have? I thought I had a motion. I did. Okay. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Kyle Noose, and I'm a Johnson resident, obviously, and the development director at River Arts. River Arts is a 501c3 nonprofit community art organization based in Morseville, Vermont. River Arts was founded in 2000 and for the last 24 years has served all of Lamoille County in northern Vermont. River Arts' mission is to enrich the community through the arts. Our core operating value is arts for everyone, committed to making art accessible no matter race, gender expression, age, ability, or financial means. 
In 2023, we enhanced the lives of over 5,000 people through offering 125 free community events, tuition-based art classes, summer camps, gallery openings, and meaningful partnerships with area organizations like Vermont State University, Jenna's Promise, Lamoille Neighbors, Lamoille Family Center, and Northeastern Recovery Center, just to name a few. In 2023, 56 um, Johnson residents signed up for classes or workshops with us, and 267 more participated in our free events. We awarded over $30,000 in scholarships to our classes and camps, and we never turn anyone away because of financial means. So today we're asking Johnson, Hyde Park, Morseville, and Elmore, the four towns who residents utilize our services the most, to invest in our mission with a town appropriation that we can count on every year to keep our doors open and programs running. I'll just end this little um, presentation with a statement that a 2023 Johnson summer camp parent gave, gave us permission to share. My children were able to attend summer camp with financial assistance from River Arts. Both kids really enjoyed camp and they came home every day excited to share what they did and show off their new skills. Having enrichment activities like this in our community is so important. We live in a small rural community so options can be limited. Thank you. Discussion further. I am seeing, yes. I'm here, David. Uh, Lois Fry. Um, and I appreciate what River Arts does. I think they do a great job. And I, I read the report that, that Kyle had sent out. But the reason that I don't support the article is that it's adding a new organization to the outside organizations in our town. They're all worthwhile, but we have to make some decisions. The, an example of the Conservation Commission is $1,500 a year, and we were cut this year because of budget limitations, as every organization in the community was. So I hesitate to add one more, which will then be perpetuated every year. But we do appreciate River Rides. Thank you. Hi there, Scott Meyer. Um, Town of Johnson, Village of Johnson, and I already lost the page. Um, page 29 in your book has a list of all the other stuff we do for getting to other organizations. And I'm not for or against, I just wanted to bring it up. So if you're interested in what we pay for, page 29 of your book. Hi, Jackie Stanton. Uh, I can't say enough about uh, River Arts and what a treasure it is uh, for our region. The fact that we haven't um, chipped in for the past 24 years <laughs> is, is the surprising thing to me. I could go on and on about the arts and the benefits of, of arts for our community, for, uh, you know, from kids from 2 to 92, uh, but I won't. Um, what I will say is that I work at the Lamoille Family Center that was uh, mentioned and one of the aspects of uh, my job is providing four free weekly play groups um, in the region for parents and caregivers and their children. One of those play groups, we partner with River Arts for the past eight or nine years, and we use their venue and we use a lot of their equipment, and it's just the most successful, joyous um, community event. Every single week, there are probably 20-something children and their parents and caregivers, many of them, our Johnson residents through the years, and um, I just can't say enough, and I, I hope we'll vote for this. Jan Gerhart, um, I just wanted to comment on the value and the joyousness that River Arts adds to our community, not just Johnson, but the Lamoille County, from children to elderly, um, the art classes, the free events, um, you name it, they have it. And I would like to support them with $1,500 from our town. Thank you. 
Yeah. Isaac Eddy. I'm a Johnson resident. This is Gael. And I, for many years, was on the board at River Arts. And for many years, I've been teaching performing arts here at Vermont State University, Johnson. I'm losing my job after this semester because Vermont State University is cutting uh, their performing arts program on this campus. And I support giving River Arts $1,500 for arts literacy. We need to, as a town, say that we support uh, what the arts does for everybody. And I think the River Arts statement of arts for everyone is more important now than ever. So I say, yes, let's do this. Thank you. Seeing no further hands, the question is yours. Uh, the, the motion was to raise appropriate and expend the sum of $1,500 for the support of River Arts to provide services to residents of the town. All in favor of that motion signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. The ayes have it. The uh, motion is carried. Um, other other business. Hi, <clears throat> excuse me. Hi, my name is Paul Warden. Uh, I have a couple of things I'd like to mention. Um, I'm the Johnson representative to the Moyle Fibernet, and I wanted to first of all thank the select board for their support. Uh, through the ARPA grants uh, for the Moyle Fibernet earlier this year. Secondly, I wanted to just remind everybody, um, I hope you had a chance to read the report that was in the uh, book this year. It's on page 107 about our accomplishments through 2020, 2023 and goals for 2024. Um, long story short, the CUD is grant funded and those grant funds can only be used to reach the currently unserved and underserved addresses. And the reason I bring that up is that in order to build to those addresses, necessarily the fiber lines have to pass other addresses. So in short, to try not to get this complicated, but that leaves us with three buckets of addresses, the unserved and underserved that the Moyle fiber net will be able to reach, those that are incidentally passed, they call them, you're on the way. And those of you that aren't. If you aren't, Fidium's, uh, it's a commercial business. Their idea is to obviously grow their business. They're gonna to try to build you at some point. The reason I'm standing up here today though is I'm encouraging people to consider pre-registering with Fidium for service. All that involves is going on the website, putting in your address and saying, your email address and saying, hey, let me know when service is available in my area. What that does is it incentivizes Fidium to build to your area sooner. You make no commitment until they actually install it in your house. So you're not promising to do anything. You're just expressing interest. But the more people in Johnson that do that, the sooner we'll get part of Johnson built. So that's, uh, that's all I have to say about the Moyle Fiber Net other than it's coming and I'm very, very hopeful. Um, I do have a couple other things I'd like to say if nobody else does. <laughs> uh, the question was whether the web address is on there and no, I was not smart enough to add it, but uh, lamoyafiber.net. Lamoyafiber .net. .net. Lamoyafiber.net. Uh, the second quick note is in regard to the Planning Commission. Uh, we have a report in your book on page 45. As you may have read, uh, we spent a lot of the time working on the new updated municipal development plan. And I wanted to thank all the citizens for all the input that you provided and the survey that we did earlier in the year. That was extremely helpful and factored into a lot of the recommendations we're making throughout the plan. That will be finalized sometime later this month. It will be turned into the select board. Uh, the Planning Commission will then hold, will publicize it on the website and hold a town meeting for input. And then the select board will hold a series of their own meetings. The reason I'm bringing this up is that one of the recommendations that we made is that we consider modifying form-based code. Form-based code, if you remember, 
has to do with governing how the buildings look downtown. The concern that's been raised is that the flood proofing that's being discussed for Sterling Market might run afoul of form-based code. And the way the form-based code is currently written, the Development Review Board has some discretion, but it's a little unclear as to what discretion and what authority they have. And so the recommendation that uh, the Planning Commission put forth is that consider uh, revising that and specifically to allow the Development Review Board to grant exceptions to form-based code standards for purposes of flood proofing and flood resiliency. Um, if it's appropriate, I thought it might be helpful to propose a non-binding referendum, if you will, for a vote here today to help guide the select board in that direction. Is that an appropriate step, David? Do <clears throat> you have wording? Funny you should ask. <laughs> I do. Well, well, let's hear it. Okay, the wording is as follows. Shall the voters of Johnson authorize the select board to initiate the process to modify form-based code to clarify that Development Review Board has the authority to grant exceptions to the building envelope standards and other form-based code requirements for the purposes of flood proofing and flood resiliency. Thank you. Is there a second, <clears throat> a second to that motion? There is a second. Is there any further discussion? I will, before I call for the vote. Okay, seeing no other hands. <clears throat> the motion is that the um, builders of Johnson authorize the select board to initiate the process to modify form-based code to clarify that the development review board has the authority to grant exemptions to the building envelope standards and other FBC requirements for flood proofing and flood resiliency. That's the motion. We have a motion. We have a second. We have a second. Of course. That's why we're here. <coughs> So, Paul, maybe you can help me out with this. Um, I'm not opposed to the idea behind the motion at all, um, but wouldn't it properly be something that the Planning Commission drafts and put in front of the select board in terms of a specific, specific modification to the code based on what you're talking about? If I'd been smart enough, I would have circulated a petition and had it on today's ballot. However, I wasn't. So, sure, that's another way to do it. My purpose today is just to hopefully get an expression from the citizens to the select board that this is an issue of interest. It would be non-binding because it wasn't on the warrant. So, if you all collectively feel it's not appropriate, then select the Planning Commission can certainly put it forward instead. Uh, as presented, uh, it takes the form of a resolution under other business. You cannot do any business business. Um, so this is merely a recommendation and, and not a mandate. Is that clear? Is that resolved at all? To the, extent, to the extent that that's possible here and now? Okay. Is there any further discussion? Yes. Paul, is this in response to the new market wanting to build the six foot wall, retaining wall around the market? Uh, not specifically. The initial discussions that I was, was part of was that, for example, one of these uh, building envelope standards for uh, form based codes is that. 60% of the front of a building has to be glazing, that is doors or windows, and the windows have to be five feet tall. Well, if they were gonna flood proof it up to say six feet, the windows probably wouldn't be five feet tall anymore. They'd be maybe only four feet tall. 
Is that a problem? So not specifically Kyle, no, but that is another example that could come up. Yes. Charlie Gallanter. I'm a member of the Planning Commission. Frankly, this is news to me that we're putting this forward. Uh, one of the problems with this is that zoning bylaws need to originate with the Planning Commission. They draft them, have two public hearings. They forward them to the um, select board and, in our case, the village trustees group who then have to have their own public hearings to any changes. And it's a cumbersome process, but it does originate with the Planning Commission as opposed to originating with the select board. If I might, uh, what Charlie said is absolutely true. And again, this is a non-binding thing. This is an expression of interest and concern only. Anything further? Seeing none, the proposal for a resolution um, to the effect the voters of Johnson authorized the select board to initiate the process to modify, modify form-based code to clarify that the Development Review Board has the authority to grant exemptions to the building envelope standards and other FBC requirements. for the purpose of flood proofing or flood resiliency. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Ayes have it. No. I already have a, a prior or offering. I just gonna be really quick. Um, I would just um, ask that you yourself or your friends or family or whomever um, seriously consider your civic duties or volunteering for a committee or a regional commission or something of that nature on pages eight and nine and 10 of the town report. Um, there are a list of the, the different roles that are appointed or volunteer. Um, we always have a lot of vacancies and um, I think that it would be really great if your friends, neighbors, whomever um, shows interest in participating in our community seriously consider volunteering for one of those roles. wanted to give a quick report last year at town meeting you guys voted to expend up to fifty thousand dollars for a community and economic development specialist and i just wanted to report that uh randall zott has been hired and has been very successful so far especially with the light industrial park um, working with all the local committees to get grant applications out there and approved um, and also um, just working through all the logistics um, of, of state government. His experience and his wealth of experience has been invaluable to us. And I just wanted to say thanks for making that decision a year ago. It makes my life easier today. So, yeah. No more hands. Before you <clears throat> do the A motion, <clears throat> Uh, I was asked earlier that uh, those of you who are kind enough to stay late uh, are going to be asked to help stack chairs. So if you're, if you're fit, you're able, and uh, you're not going to get shot if you get home late, um, please pick up your chair. And there's some place to put it. I just don't know what that is yet. Yes. Is there a second? Second. So that's not amendable, it's not debatable. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Bye. Bye.